I'd like to call to order the regular formal meeting of the Iowa City City Council for November the 19th, 2019. Roll call, please. Cole? Here. Mims? Here. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Here. Teague? Here. Thomas? Here. Throgmorton? Here. Item two, student leadership awards. So Tessa and Katya should come up, please. Hello again, it's good to see both of you. Let me stand between you, okay? Great. All right, so you're both from Lincoln Elementary, is that right? What a great school. Do you like the renovations? Yes. Oh man, it's so much different. I had a chance to tour through the school with uh, your uh, acting principal, Julie Robinson, several weeks ago. It was really great fun to do that. She was so proud of what's been done out there. So wow, lucky you. So, all right, so both of you have brought your speeches, right? Because we talked about that ahead of time. So Katya, I'm gonna ask you to go first. And this is incidentally Katya Ellermeyer. So Katya, I'm gonna ask you to read your speech and then I'll ask you, Tessa, to read yours and then I'll read the awards, okay? All right, you're first, Katya. Good evening, my name is Katya Elmer. I feel honored that I was nominated for this award by my teacher, Ms. Miller. I believe that I was nominated for this award because I work hard and push myself and, I, and push myself. I take any chance to go above and beyond. I also think that I was nominated for this award because I always take any chance to volunteer with the kindergartners and second graders to help them read and understand their math work. I truly appreciate this honor, thank you. Great job, great job. All right, now, Tessa, I gotta get this open, sorry. I can't, can you hold it? Yes. Thanks for waiting. So now we have Tessa Driscoll, who also is a fabulous student at Lincoln Elementary. And you're gonna read your speech too, right, Tessa? Okay. Yes. Hello, my name is Tessa Driscoll. I was nominated for this award by my teacher, Ms. Miller. I feel privileged to be nominated by her with my friend, Katia. I think that I was nominated for this award because of a few things. First of all, I try my hardest with my work and try and exceed expectations. My work is always on time and I believe that if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. Working hard in school has always meant a lot to me and I try and live up to that standard of working hard. I enjoy doing my work and participating in school activities. Lastly, I volunteer around the school and help the first graders, second graders, and kindergartners with their daily work. Thank you. All right, beautifully done. I'll bet Tessa's parents are out there somewhere. Can you kind of wave around and, and relatives and everybody else? <laughs> You're doing a great job. And Katya. Your parents, I know, are out there because I saw them just a little bit ago. There's one, there's another, and a sister. Oh, man, another sister? They're everywhere. <laughs> so y'all are doing a great job. You're doing what uh, my friend Bruce Teague back here says is an awesome and amazing job at Lincoln Elementary, so bravo to you. All right, so your student leadership awards are identical except you have two different names, right? So I'm just gonna read it one time. Student Leadership Award for your outstanding qualities of leadership within Lincoln Elementary, as well as the community, and for your sense of responsibility and helpfulness to others, we recognize Katya Ellermeyer and Tessa Driscoll. Dr. Driscoll, thank you. As an outstanding student leader, your community is proud of you. Presented by the Iowa City City Council, November 2019. So. Tessa, here's yours. Katya, here's yours. Please join me in congratulating our fabulous students. Well done. Okay. Well done, parents.
se prensa. Okay. okay, we can move on to item three, proclamations. We have one proclamation to read tonight. Whereas transgender people come from all walks of life and make up a part of a diverse community representing all racial, ethnic, and religious backgrounds, and whereas transgender individuals around the world and in the United States are exposed to widespread social stigma, discrimination, harassment, and physical and sexual abuse, and whereas the city recognizes the increasing rate of deaths <coughs> by violence of transgender individuals nationwide, and the disproportionate effects of this against transgender women of color, and whereas our entire community is diminished when we lose the talents and contributions of any member of our community prematurely, whether due to direct anti-transgender violence or due to suicide or other health effects resulting from trauma or discrimination. And whereas Transgender, transgender Day of Remembrance began in 1999, as a vigil to honor the memory of Rita Hester, a transgender woman who was killed in 1998, and to raise awareness of hate crimes against transgender people. And whereas the city of Iowa City honors the bravery and resilience of transgender individuals who live, work, or play in our city in their authentic gender, and although we are proud of the existing legal protections we have for transgender individuals to pursue, to pursue their lives, free from discrimination in Iowa City, we reaffirm a commitment to ongoing efforts to promote full inclusion of transgender individuals. And whereas the city of Iowa City is committed to diversity, social justice, equity, and mutual safety, and respect and safety of those a part of this community. Now, therefore, I, James A. Throgmorton, Mayor of Iowa City, do hereby proclaim November the 20th as Transgender Remembrance Day in Iowa City. Is there someone who could come up to accept this proclamation? Please come on up. And you're yeah, could you please just say a few words if you want to? Yeah. Good evening, my name is Noemi Ford and I am a commission member of the Iowa City uh, Human Rights Board. Um, I'm here to accept um, with great honor this uh, document from you. And as our mayor mentioned, today is the Transgender Day of Remembrance in which we seek to highlight the losses we face due to anti-transgender bigotry and violence. In 2019, advocates tracked at least 22 deaths of at least transgender or gender non-conforming people in the United States due to fatal violence, the majority of whom were black transgender women. These victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, and strangers, some of whom have been arrested and charged while others have yet to be identified. Some of these cases involve clear anti-transgender bias. In others, the victim's transgender status may have put them at risk in other ways, such as forcing them into unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and a war survival sex work. While these details of these cases differ, it is clear that fatal violence disproportionately affects transgender women of color, and that the intersection of racism, sexism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and unchecked access to guns conspire to deprive them of employment, housing, healthcare, and other necessities, barriers that make them vulnerable. As is too often the case in the reporting of anti-transgender violence, many of these victims are misgendered in local police statements and media reports, which can delay our awareness of such deadly incidents. And while you pointed out that Iowa City is definitely doing great work in protecting these individuals' rights, I think it's important to also notice that we live in the state of Iowa, where there are no bans on insurance exclusions for transgender health care, nor does our state provide transgender inclusive health benefits to state employees. 
Uh, and again, to note that our state has no restrictions on uh, so-called conversion therapy, which is something that is considered crucial that our state uh, starts to um, advocate a ban against um, painful and hurtful ways of uh, changing an individual's identity, sexual identity or gender identity. Um, and as a reminder, in 2019, our governor, Kim Reynolds, um, signed into law the state's Health and Human Services Department funding bill, which contains a discriminatory anti-transgender provision that allows legislators to refuse state funding for critically important, often life-saving, transition-related care for transgender Iowans, even though the state's Supreme Court ruled that Iowa's Civil Rights Act protects transgender Iowans from discrimination based on gender identity, including in the provision of services via Medicaid, and our governor's legislation directly attempts to undermine that ruling. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we can move to item items four through nine, which is a consent calendar. Could I have a motion to approve items four through nine as amended minus item seven C? So moved. Moved by Mem, second by Sally. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. T? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Could I have a motion to approve item 7C? I should read it though before I do that. Move. Second. Well, <laughs> sorry, I got ahead of the game. So item 7C is personnel policies update November 2019 mm -hmm. and a resolution rescinding re resolution number 17 uh, 198 and adopting updated personnel policies. So did I hear a motion to approve from yes. what, Rockney and then or from, from Salee and second seconded by Cole? Motion to approve with removal of section 7.8. Oh, nope. I have it written down right here. Okay. Yeah, a, as Eleanor just said. Yeah, move. Second. All right, so discussion. I May wanna, oh. Is this one I could ask? I, I was going to ask Eleanor for some clarification on this item because I just had some concern from a union standpoint because I'm used to um, whenever uh, employee personnel policies were, were changed or updated uh, when I worked at the hospital with the union uh, was consulted and they worked together on that. So, um, and they're, they're described as key changes. So I just wondered if normally the union would play a part in the discussions or because I, I would have liked to have tabled it to, to have them give comment on that, but I'd like to hear so your... So the personnel policies, which of course we've had in place forever, um, are, are management policies relating to conduct in the workplace, expectations in the workplace, um, things like equal employment, substance abuse policy, sexual harassment policy, conflicts of interest, those kinds of things. Um, there's nothing in here that affects the scope of bargaining um, that's governed by Chapter 22, um, and you can see at the very beginning of the po or it's Chapter 20. I'm sorry, you can see at the very very beginning of the policy it preserves, you know, Chapter 20, and it also preserves the well, it couldn't not do that, and it also preserves the civil service prov provisions of Chapter 400. It also doesn't have any bearing on whether the city would agree to negotiate certain items or not negotiate certain items, it, it doesn't address those matters. So it, certainly you have the ability to, to defer it, but I, I don't think that this is a matter that, that um, unless the union can identify a specific issue that they're concerned about that should affect them. And, and to my knowledge, we've never had the personnel policies reviewed by the union. So they could now, though, uh, if, if they've seen something, they could bring that the attention to HR or something, and, and that they, they could. They I mean, could, they can be. They amended. still could. The council can always okay. amend them, but I, it would be it would be an unusual practice, I think, for us to to invite the union to participate in our personnel policies. And again, it does not affect the scope of bargaining. It's, it sounds like there was some concern about the changes that were made to Chapter 20, and perhaps this would have some impact on that, and it does not. Is there any way we can hear from them, Jim? 
Uh, 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 who do you mean by them? The union. Uh, it, we could ask for comment from anybody. No. Oh. Yeah, you, I think you, Chris would like to come talk. on up, Chris. I think Chris would like to speak to it. Chris Weinard, AFSCME Local 183 Vice President. Um, I know we haven't in the past uh, been involved in uh, these kind of items, but without knowing what's all in this and seeing major changes, um, it just would have been nice if we could have discussed these. I, I know we can't say no, we don't want this to happen, but we can maybe point out some things um, that uh, personnel hasn't, you know, considered. Um, the ramifications down the road, um, should a contract be eliminated, um, this could be something, you know, that, that comes into play regarding discipline, regarding, you know, whatever. We don't know what's, what's in this group. We just understood that there were some major changes, and we'd like to sit and, and talk about them. So there's no major concern right now that you identify I don't or know can what's, pinpoint? I okay. what's in she it. She hasn't had a chance to see it. Okay. All right. If you look at the cover memo to the personnel policies, you can you can see there the, the things that have been identified. And I think if you look at that list of what's been changed, um, that confirms that we're, we're not talking about anything that affects uh, the scope of negotiations or bargaining rights. And, and, and the changes to Chapter 20 would not, would not have any bearing on whether the union looked at our personnel policies or not. So I, I mean. Sure, yeah, I don't know, but can, is there a way we can defer this until we just talk to them and see what they can look into it and if they have concerns, they can bring it up? Uh, yeah, yeah, there is a way. Jeff, uh, can, from a manager's point of view, are there any complications associated with doing that? No. The, o the only concern I have is the whistleblower policy and state um, office policy um, is a new requirement of state yeah, law that uh, needs to be included. Yeah. I, I was just going to get into that. Are, are there any parts of the personnel policy that we're updating by reason of state code, in which case oh. we have to? Um, so absent the ones that we have to do by state code, could we then defer? So I would support amending the things that we have to amend now and deferring the discretionary portions. Is that possible or, or I not? I don't think we no. want to do that. There's too okay. many. Is there any problem deferring, though, for now? I think as long as we're, as we're back in the next meeting, and, okay. and frankly, we, you know, these, I think these items are all routine. I don't okay. think the discussion should be very long. Okay. If we can come back on December 3rd and get them approved, yes. I don't think there's sure. any harm to that. Um, but to be clear, this is on your consent calendar because we consider it routine and uh, not a, mm -hmm. uh, maybe for lack of a better term, impactful change. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we would consider this more housekeeping, cleanup, compliance with new state code, compliance with some things that came out of our CDL um, audit that we had recently. Um, yeah, and then we had some standalone policies um, that have been uh, created over the years that we felt would be um, recognized easier if it was just incorporated in here. So uh, we have no problem delaying it for a, sure. a couple of weeks for the next meeting, but the longer the delay is, the, the more we're going to run into the issues with the required changes. Next so, week? Okay. So uh, next if week. we want a motion to defer, um, all we, all we need, I'm sorry, if we want to do that, all we need is a motion to defer yep. action on this to the, the December 3rd meeting. I will move that motion Second. to defer it. Moved by Sway, seconded by Cole. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. No? Voice vote. Voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, so we'll uh, revisit that uh, at our next meeting. Okay, let's see, where are we? All right, so we come to item 10, community comment. 
Uh, anybody who would like to address any topic that is not on the formal meeting agenda should feel free to come up and do that now. Please take not more than probably three. I don't know. How many people would like to speak during community comment period? One, two, three, four. All right. Uh, try to limit your comments to three minutes, uh, and we'll go from there. Please state your name when you come up. Hi, Karen. Hi, my name is Karen Cubby, and I'm here to talk about the housing into homes issue that you've been talking about and there the emergency request for $25,000 for an executive director. And I just want to say I don't have any conflicts with the agencies. I don't have any fiduciary responsibilities with any of the agencies, although certainly at different parts of my life I have used services that have helped me greatly through varying times of my life. I also under the, understand the challenges of running a nonprofit agency, being the director of the Emma Goldman Clinic for 10 years. You got to scrap, be scrappy person. <laughs> you have to put together a lot of things, understand funding cycles, and really have great communication with the community and have agencies working together really well. But in hearing the discussion earlier tonight at your work session, I really felt like the frame was a little off for me about how things were being talked about. So. Um, it's not really children sleeping on floors versus some esoteric discussion about good process. Um, or maybe it's about both of them. <laughs> but it felt like that conversation was very reactive. And what I guess I'm looking for from you all is more of a nuanced response. Um, and I feel like, how do we ensure that furniture is getting to people who need it? in the short run, while Houses to Homes figures out the strategic logistics of getting an executive director. Because really, for me, it's about the mission. It's about the mission of getting people what they need. I'm not so attached as to how it happens, but I also, I'm also attached to this fair process where the city has challenged agencies through the aid, uh, aid to agencies process to not duplicate services, to work together, to make sure that there is a package of services. And this request kind of circumvents that. But I also want furniture getting to people soon. So I want a short-term solution um, that that gets furniture to people while still having a fair, equitable, and respectful process. This is how, if, if we can figure out, or if you all can figure out how to be in that creative space, the missions will be served. There will not be rifts in the nonprofit community that, that has to heal or figure out how to do that healing. Agencies are willing to pitch in in the short run to, in the short run to make sure that there's transportation, that there's volunteers. Um, and so I really hope that you will just think through the short and long term of this and really have a great response versus kind of a reaction to, um, I mean, I don't think that Houses to Homes really understood that in making this request quest kind of what the reaction would be. But it's an opportunity to have agencies work together. But I have to say that I don't believe that an, an executive director request is an emergency. It is a strategic request, and maybe one that will be needed. So let's figure out how to get furniture to people while encouraging houses to homes to figure out how to get that aid to agencies application in and have it be strong with the support from other agencies, potentially. Let's, will you help us get to that place? Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Good evening, Brandon. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, a couple things. Uh, one is that uh, at the um, at the recreation center uh, there is a police office, and the police office uh, is uh, in the open area with a uh, police emblem on the door, and. Um, and police apparently inside sometimes, uh, though people don't tend to know when the police person is in there. I think uh, much like the, uh, the no loitering signs which were taken down recently, that having a police office in the rec center uh, is a kind of slippery slope. I think that it's a, uh, it's a profiling. Uh, the police uh, officer who I spoke with who, who works in there said that they needed the office space. Um, and uh, 
you know, I thought, well, they don't have it in the senior center. Uh, you know, uh, why do they have it in the recreation center? I spent a long time in my childhood uh, at the YMCA. We never had a police station office in uh, in there, and I think that it's a it's a profiling issue. Uh, I think when you consider who's who's in that place, uh, I think it's it gives a bad impression. It gives a bad impression to me, but also uh, that door with the police insignia and all the things about law enforcement and everything like that does not give people a good feeling uh, who go there, and it's insidious. So you don't know exactly while you're going by. You know, kids would probably just assume, oh, there's police around here. Uh, I don't. I just think it's a bad place to put a police office. If they need space, they should put it somewhere else. I think it's profiling. Um, my other point, uh, I think that's important. I think, uh, you know, I, where should the police be in that case? My other point is uh, it's winter. And uh, last year was, was especially hard for walkers. I, uh, I actually had to walk in the street a lot because there was a lot of ice. And many of you know this, uh, you know, it's hard enough to get in your car if you drive. But most of us uh, actually are on foot or handicapped. Some people don't, don't have cars, uh, some people do. And I went to a, con uh, a transportation conference, which was at the public library this past week, was very interesting. And they were trying to figure out what were ways in order to get people to ride more transportation. Well, the key, the key season for riding public transportation is winter. But the problem is, is that if the sidewalks aren't cleared, uh, people are not going to go to take public transportation. Downtown, the sidewalks are clear. Everywhere else, they're not. And for instance, if, for instance, everybody get the, the best possible circumstance, everybody shovels their driveway, you still have a kind of Olympic course of different things. Some people use a snowblower. Some people have two inches of ice. Some people who are fastidious go right down to the bare minimum. A friend of mine who's 27, uh, was 27 at the time, was walking on what seemed to be one of the clearest spaces in front of a house uh, that she had walked by, slipped and fell and broke over 20 bones in her arm, and she was in the hospital for over 10 days. Now, the problem is, is that the city uh, can create a consistency in the streets, which helps drivers, but they can't create, or they don't create, a consistency of sidewalks. So my suggestion is that the city, I know, I know that our governor said that we have a surplus and she's going to go right to her ATM and, and send it over here. But I think that it's, it's discriminatory to not plow the sidewalks for people who must walk, all people, while plowing the streets. Plow the sidewalks. Brandon, please. Otherwise, wrap, we cannot, wrap, wrap we cannot, up, we cannot uh, transport ourselves. Please consider it. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Craig Mosher. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I live at Iowa City Co-Housing over on Miller Avenue, where we're building, as probably maybe you know, a highly energy efficient, uh, solar powered electric, all electric homes. So this is doable, what we were talking about earlier this evening. Um, and I also work with the Johnson Clean Energy District, which is working to gear up a major program in the coming year to provide energy efficiency services to a, a wide range of, of homes and businesses. So I, I think there are possibilities to do this. Um, one comment about one thing I heard in the, the 100 day report is the emphasis on education. Recall that the research indicates that education by itself doesn't really change people's behavior very much. That what really changes people's behavior is when they see their neighbors and their friends doing something differently. So I encourage you to think about that outreach portion of the program as focusing maybe neighborhood by neighborhood, creating that cultural shift that we're talking about on a neighborhood basis because that'll be self-reinforcing and it'll spread more effectively than simply doing broad education stuff that doesn't really change people's behavior. So energy efficiency, let's just talk a minute. I think we all understand 
energy efficiency work in housing and in, in other buildings, uh, reduces energy bills and saves people money, it increases comfort, have fewer drafts and stuff, and it reduces carbon emissions, right? So this is really key to the program. The biggest bang for the buck is clearly in the LMI sector because that's where the most leaky housing is, right? So we can reduce carbon emissions more per dollar invested in that se sector. So I think the city's focus on LMI is gonna be really valuable and I encourage you to really push it in that direction. Um, this also means, of course, that rental housing and retrofitting rental housing is a key issue and a real challenge. How do you incentivize landlords to do this work when there's not a financial incentive for them to do it? So I think we need to work with that. Uh, we might want to look at requiring that uh, tenants be informed about the energy costs and use in, in each unit when we can do that. Uh, even if it's by floor or by building in the beginning. Um, I think we can require some energy efficiency measures uh, through the building code and so forth, obviously. But also, we can require super insulation, super energy efficiency measures in new construction. And we're demonstrating this at Prairie Hill. So we can make a building really tight. The, the latest technique is to, when you finish the sheetrock work, you go in and you pressurize the inside of the building. You spray a fog of foam that goes out every little nook and cranny, and it makes an extremely tight house. So just things like that. And lastly, I would just say, consider, as some cities are talking about, a tax on carbon, <laughs> okay? There are, there are some models for doing that, and it would be interesting for Iowa City to look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Good evening, Chrissy. Good evening. Uh, Chrissy Canganelli with Shelter House. Um, just wanted to provide a clarification, if not correction, to the record from the work session. Um, Councilman Cole mentioned that um, at some point in the last year, the council had uh, determined to um, give $10,000 to Shelter House uh, in conjunction with um, the uh, bench debacle. I can't remember the phrasing that Councilman Thomas used, but um, it was certainly a challenging time. I just wanted to clarify, and I don't know that this was intentionally uh, obfuscated, but uh, Shelter House did not request that money in any way, shape, or form, and I want the record to show that. Um, it put us in a very difficult situation, and we immediately turned that money over into a community pot, which was then used to seed the risk mitigation fund, which the city has also added to, which will be allocated and distributed through the coordinated entry process, which involves a collaborative team of multiple organizations around the table. So just wanted to have that as a part of the formal record. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Christy Dozer. I'm the executive director of the Domestic Violence Intervention Program. And I just wanted to um, speak briefly to uh, some of the situation we've been talking about with houses into homes. One of the reasons I wanted to come up and speak is because DVIP was the original furniture project. And in the last 20 years, uh, there have been two iterations of the furniture project, and this will be the third, and all three have received city funding in order to perform that service. And I think one of the most important things that happens with process, all of the process that we've been talking about, um, uh, an application, a review, uh, an evaluation, is about the ethical and fiscal responsibility of the community and how our organizations um, work in contract and in collaboration with the city and with each other. Having that application process is really about the accountability that we all share. And so as an organization, um, we are part of that accountability. DVIP is part of that. We have to demonstrate our capacity. We have to demonstrate um, our ethics and we have to demonstrate our practice, and then we have to demonstrate our fiscal responsibility. 
I think that that process is critical in our community. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, it creates a fair and consistent way that we can communicate with each other about our expectations as a community. Going back to speaking as the first furniture project, I was one of the individuals who supervised that and was also part of the group that worked with um, Habitat when they took it on. Um, sustainability is a huge issue. And I do believe that um, the houses into homes is not a actual duplication. I think that what they're doing is wonderful. I name that absolutely forefront. The work that they're doing is important. Um, I think that uh, having gone through the process, um, what I've learned when we've brought new programs or new resources to the community, or when we've looked at new services or how we diminish barriers for victims of domestic violence, that application process and that communication within the community also taught us what the community needed and how we could collaborate and how we could um, be a responsible partner. And so I would really encourage you to look at, I think some of the feedback I heard about developing a process on, on defining an emergency and on, on um, how emerging programs get funding um, for services and staff and organizations. Uh, I would really highly encourage you to follow that process and we will absolutely participate in that, not only as an organization, but I, I say that in partnership with many of the other programs. Um, but I do want to say that, that I was disappointed that um, there wasn't an expectation that that process should happen. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Anyone else? I left my sticker. I got it. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Good evening. Thank you for letting us speak tonight. My name is Lucy Barker, and I'm from Houses Into Homes. We want to thank you for supporting our request for funds. I'd like to start by saying that our work is an emotional and compelling story. And you will hear some of those stories tonight, but Houses Into Homes is not operating on an emotional basis. We have developed a deliberate, considered, and methodical program that meets the need in the community. So I'm going to address some of the concerns that were raised after the recent vote and provide some background. And then Selena uh, wants to respond to some of the comments made at the last council meeting. First, Houses Into Homes is providing a service that is not being met in the community. Regarding your request for a conversation, our very first outreach on December 13, 2017, to the social services community was a meeting with representatives of Shelter House and DVIP, as well as city, Iowa City staff. And what we heard from them was that since the furniture project ceased operations, there had been a huge gap in the community's ability to provide beds and furniture to those in need. We would not have pursued this service if we had been told that the need was covered. In fact, we met with the same group along with Habitat for Humanity and Restore again a month later in January 2018. At the same time, we reached out to executive directors at several agencies, include, including the then Crisis Center, DVIP, Inside Out Reentry, Iowa City Compassion, and more. And we met with some of those executives, and in other cases, the executives referred us to others in the organization. Second, the immense need in the community has put an unsustainable strain on houses into homes. We have a staff of two volunteers managing the program, and we depend on the hard work of dozens of community volunteers. We manage a 3,500 square foot warehouse. We perform on-site visits to determine the needs of our recipients. We organize pickups of donations and deliveries. In under two years, we have been asked to and have been able to provide beds, furniture, and other items to over 200 households. We have diverted an estimated 50 tons of perfectly usable furnishings and mattresses from the landfill. So we are surprised and disappointed that some think that this amount of work does not merit a salary and a paid position. So we have one director paid two days a week and a second director who's unpaid. 
Despite the fact that we are working a number of hours that are frankly unsustainable, we were forced to temporarily halt accepting new referrals as our waiting list had grown to over 40 households, resulting in a waiting time of greater than six weeks. Houses into homes is unsustainable without support for a full-time director. Third, as you and others here are aware, the process of grant application is not equitable to all agencies, and in fact excludes new agencies like ours. The Johnson County Supervisor saw that inequity and opened their emergency funding application to agencies not already receiving funding. The Supervisor saw value in our work and partially funded our emergency funding request. Thus, to summarize what stimulated the request for funding, one, there is an enormous unmet need in Johnson County for mattresses, furniture, and other household items. Two, responding to the referrals of 14 social service agencies has placed an unsustainable strain on houses into homes. And three, the current funding process left the organization little, op little option but to reach out to multiple potential sources of funding in the community, including the city of Iowa City. Thank you. Um, my name is Selena with an L McCarty. Um, thank you for having us. Um, we really wanted to keep our ask in this conversation focused on the need and our community because it's tremendous. It's much more than we ever imagined. We did not want the need to be this much. We did not want it to have to grow into full-time work, but there are literally hundreds of children sleeping on the floor and you can paint that any way you want, but if you haven't slept on the floor, you have no idea how horrible that is to try to go to school and be successful, to try to go to work and be successful, to try to not have road rage when you're driving down the road trying to get to work. Lack of rest has been proven and researched to cause all kinds of health issues and mental health issues. So I, I want to start there. Um, I, we did not imagine that a successful request to the city would engender such consternation in some members of the community. Unfortunately, we are now obligated to correct the record with respect to some public statements made since the recent vote. We've had council members, city staff members, and community members ask us to respond to these. That's why we're doing this. We were very disappointed to hear the executive director of Shelter House say that on multiple occasions, my organization offered administrative support, a VISTA volunteer, resources, and guidance, and at every turn, we were turned away, denied. This is untrue. We have met with representatives from Shelter House, including Ms. Canganelli herself, Mark, the executive director, their VISTA volunteer, and other staff, as mentioned by Lucy, Rachel, Abby Freeze, their housing coordinators, multiple times. Only Chrissy once. She invited us to the Shelter House one time. Most recently, October 15th, when two of their staff came to, three. or three of their staff visited our, I wasn't there, pneumonia, um, our storage facility and asked us as we had um, announced to the community that we needed to pause in accepting referrals if we would be able to continue our work. They did not offer any help at this meeting. They just asked us what we intended to do. Um, their VISTA volunteer did volunteer herself as a resource, but the minimal support re we received was inadequate, especially considering their encouragement of our growth and development. We have a packet with documents from all of the local agencies who encouraged us to continue on with this work because the need was so high and the gap in services was so large. We have not turned down offers of support from anyone in any form. Additionally, it may be that the other shelters are able to furnish homes for the people they put into housing, and we have always supported their efforts to do so. Um, Shelter House specifically explained to us that they are only able to serve people who fit the criteria for the HUD definition of homelessness, leaving a great gap in who they can serve. That was made apparent to us when we asked if they could help us and go in on storage space to collaborate for furniture. And we were told we could not receive any of that funding because they might lose that federal status of helping um, HUD criteria homelessness. Um, there are many more in our community who are not eligible for services from our uh, shelters, and this is known. Um, we've also been told that we are duplicating existing services from other agencies. Um, one of those agencies has sent us 40 referrals, five which came in yesterday. Today, when I reached out to that agency to ask for clarification on whether we're duplicating a service that they offer, they offered us times to meet tomorrow during the business day and Thursday during the business day. I work full time. 
That's why I'm here. I work from 7 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I work on houses and homes from 4.30 until 2 o'clock in the morning and every weekend. My husband has Sundays off. We deliver furniture every Sunday. I'm devoting everything I can to this because the need is so incredible, and it's something that we see over and over again. It is not being met. It was also questioned whether we are collaborating with other agencies. We take referrals from 14 agencies. We are collaborating with other agencies who cannot meet this need, 14. Many of these agencies refer donors to us because they know we have a warehouse and a system to manage the donations and deliveries in a way that meets the specific needs of our recipients. The notion being floated that furniture and bed needs were being met or can be met by the current systems in place without our existence is frankly absurd. If this were the case, we would not have had to pause our referrals in September due to the 40 plus household wait list and two to three new referrals per day coming in. We would not receive calls, texts, and emails daily from community organizations and social workers seeking to become referring agency partners because they have nowhere else to turn for their clients' needs. Daily. We wouldn't have community members reaching out to us directly begging us for beds because they and their children are sleeping on the floor. Many of these community members have disabilities, chronic health issues, and mental health issues. Nearly all have endured trauma. We wouldn't have 25 households, including 35 adults and 50 children on our waiting list within three days of partially opening our referral system again. In three weeks, the time you've now told us we need to wait before this conversation can happen again, that list will have more than doubled. And we will see that need. It will come into us. We will see it. It will continue to be a mystery to the people who aren't connected to this. A person willing to claim that this need is being adequately addressed without the work of houses into homes is either being intentionally untruthful or is very disconnected from the community outside of their own organization. Earlier, you referenced these compelling stories. They're hard truths for a lot of people in our community. They're not fairy tales. They don't, it's not stories that we're trying to get you to give us money for. These are hard realities for people. Our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, our kids' classmates are going home and they're sleeping and eating and doing their homework on the floor. And it is a complete disgrace because for at any moment, the amount of people we have on our waiting list, we have the offers to fill those homes. But we can't do it because we are so limited in what we can do as a volunteer agency in spite of the thousands of hours of volunteer time that we've had committed to our agency, in spite of the thousands of hours we have ourselves committed to our agency. It is an dis absolute disservice to our community members. We are incredibly grateful for the support of the city, the county, and others who have actually taken the time to become aware of the tremendous need in our community and to carefully examine the work we are doing to combat it. Anyone who's taken the time to do that has supported us in funding and opening grants to us. We've applied for very, very competitive grants and we've received them for something like a salary that nobody else thinks is something that's necessary. That's a competitive grant. We are one of seven out of 15 who applied and we are awarded that grant. We went through the same process that everyone else in this room did who applied for it and we were chosen for that grant. So this idea that we're not scrappy and we can't do it, we've done this on our own for two years. We've fundraised, we've gathered volunteers, we've created a, an incredible community to take care of this gaping hole that the furniture project exiting left in the community. If you award us the money in three weeks, we will use it to support our transition into an operation capable of meeting the needs of some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Good evening. Hi, my name is Erin Silva, and I addressed you um, a couple weeks ago when we were here um, back in October. I would like to read to you a letter from one of our uh, school family advocates from Twain Elementary. Her name is Kayla McKee. Dear Council, before you, you have a great opportunity to make a big difference in our community. I want you to close your eyes and imagine this. You're eight years old. Your mother meets you at the bus stop outside of the shelter with a smile on her face. You're excited because mom hasn't been smiling much lately. She's been busy trying to find a place to call home for you and your two brothers and one sister. You've seen her stay up late looking at her list she's compiled of what she can afford. Iowa City is an expensive place to live, but this is where you have the most family support, which is what mom needs right now as she tries to find affordable daycare as well. 
But back to the bus stop, the smile. Mom said she's found us a place. It's close to school so I can walk. We're gonna move in two weeks. I'm so happy. On the day we move out, the shelter gives us a few things to get us started and drops us off at our new place. Mom unlocks the door and me and my siblings run around claiming spots to sleep. As night falls, I ask mom when I will get a bed. Mom, with tears in her eyes, knows that's a big expense, says she doesn't know, but we'll put blankets down for now. I try to get a good sleep, but the ground is hard and cold. The next day, I have a hard time paying attention and staying awake in class. The teacher lets me sleep in the office. And I sleep for three hours. I feel so good, but I missed all of my math and reading class. This goes on for a couple days. Now I am falling behind. I decide I'm gonna try and stay awake, but little things annoy me because I'm so tired. I get into a fight and get sent to the office. While waiting to see the principal, I fall asleep in the chair. The principal wakes me up and I tell him the problem. He's a good guy, but reminds me that we are kind, caring, and respectful. I said, I know, and decide to tell the kid I'm sorry for punching him. Next time, I'll come to the office to sleep. The advocate overhears the situation and calls my mom. When I get home, my mom said that we were getting some beds soon. A few weeks later, two nice ladies, Selena and Lucy, come to talk with my mom about what we need. And you know what? Those ladies brought me a bed a few weeks later with blankets of my own. I've never had blankets of my own. They also brought a table for us to eat together at. We talked and laughed around the dinner table. The next day at school, I didn't fall asleep in class. Heck, I wasn't even tired. You know why? Because I got a bed. I got to sleep. Good brain growing sleep. I want you to know that the scenario above could have been any one of my students last year that moved into permanent housing. What a difference it made in their behavior and academics when they were able to have a full night's rest. Having a bed and getting good sleep matters. There is no other program that offers those services the way Houses into Homes does. Selena and Lucy go above and beyond for this community, but because it is in such high demand, they need help from the city. Please don't let us down. Please support the Houses into Homes mission. And that's from Kayla McKee. I also want to add that um, in my full-time job as a youth and teen services librarian at the City of North Liberty, uh, I have kids who were with me all day today because we didn't have school uh, and they didn't have anywhere else to go while mom was working in her two jobs or her three jobs or whatever she was doing. Uh, and they're with me all day and we've served members of the North Liberty community as well. And I don't want that to be lost in the shuffle either. Um, so it's not just Iowa City. It's North Liberty. It's Coralville. Um, we're everywhere. And um, we, need, we need help. And we need somebody that can work at least two days a week for us in a capacity where we don't have to share her with her other job. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patty Parity. I'm a volunteer with Houses and Homes, was on the board, and have done almost everything that they've all done as well. And I think it's a fantastic organization. But this is a letter of support from um, the City High Student Family Advocate, as many of the student family advocates really support us, and that's where we get a lot of our referrals from as well. But here's one from the City High Advocate. To my concern, I am writing to give my full support to Houses and to Homes. I have worked with them since their inception and cannot adequately express the value of this organization to our community. I have seen many families whose lives are changed by having their houses turned into homes by this organization that started as a vision to help families in our community and has grown exponentially since 2017. As a student and family advocate in the Iowa City School District, my colleagues and I work alongside families in need every day. I could not do my work without community partners. Houses into Homes is a partner I rely on heavily. Not only providing a service to our most vulnerable families, Houses into Homes also is making a mark on our community at large by keeping usable household items out of the landfill. Selena and Lucy should be recognized as change makers in our community. Their work is essential. Houses into Homes is a big, big deal. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Olivia Barker, and this is another letter of support for Houses into Homes. It's from Amanda Mosley. Um, she's a student and family advocate in the ICCSD. She says, I have worked with Houses into Homes since it, their inception and have nothing but great things to say about the organization that Lucy and Selena run. 
I have watched houses into homes evolve over the years to better suit the needs of the families they serve, constantly making sure their processes ultimately serve the greatest good. The families I work with have nothing when they move into their new homes. The hope of houses into homes helping them outfit their homes means the world to them. Children will come to school and talk about their new beds, tables, and furniture with such joy and pride. I have worked with families when other referral systems were in place in the community, when no systems were outfitting homes was in place, and I, was, and I have to say that what Selena and Lucy have brought to our community is an invaluable resource that we have come to rely on, and I know that our most vulnerable families rely on them too. Please continue to fund houses into homes. They are working to make our community better by creating spaces for volunteering, keeping furniture and housing goods out of landfills, and most importantly, helping families belong to their homes through donating goods. Maintaining funding and support for houses into homes makes our community a better place. Please continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Would anybody else like to speak? Uh, before you start, let me, I have to ask my fellow council members a question. Uh, so normally we have to end the community comment period by eight. Uh, could I have your permission to extend this till, I don't know, 20 after at the most? Sure. Yeah. That's okay? All right. Please. Yep. Thank you, Mayor, Council. My name is uh, Curtis Uthi. I've been a resident here for many years and uh, at my job for over 17 years here in Iowa City. I wasn't really planning on speaking this evening, but um, after m many thoughts and suggestions, uh, I thought it, thought it was necessary and important to hear my voice. The re really special thing about inspiring events is that they're real and they're true. I've been uh, assisting in the pickups and delivery process ever since it started. Selena McCarty is my wife. Delivering beds and furniture, it's just not a security or love or happiness, it's normalcy. Normalcy is a different way to express my feelings and thoughts. I speak of this because I've been in the exact position growing up. Why my single mother struggled job to job and house to house. My sister and I would lay dirty clothes down on the floor of her bed. I've seen this walking into a home. It's disturbing, but this shouldn't have to be normal. In this community, it shouldn't be for any family. I say I get a little emotional on delivery day. I get very emotional. It hits home. I personally get to see the joy and the happiness that <laughs> the, these kids and this, the parents get, and it's it's awakening. It's phenomenal. Having these things is normal. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Anyone else? Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Adam Robinson. I'm the executive director at the Rape Victim Advocacy Program. Appreciate all of your efforts uh, year round. Appreciate being able to be here for a lot of the discussion earlier in the work meeting and then tonight as well. Appreciate the courageous comments of so many that have come forward tonight to share their truth. Um, similar to the last speaker, I wasn't sure if I was going to stand up. I think I, I've decided to do so to encourage, um, and not that you need it or you need the reminder, but for me, I maybe need to say it. Um, I think that the needs in this community are vast. Um, and as was discussed earlier in the work session, 
the number of nonprofits in this community are also vast, which is one of the things that makes Iowa City so beautiful. That not only are there needs um, that are life and death needs across all intersections of identities, there are folks like so many in this room who bleed, sweat, and sacrifice, whether it's their paid position, whether it's a volunteer position, um, or whether it's a paid position or volunteer position of somebody in their life, to keep kids safe, to keep kids um, and those around them connected to resources so that they can aspire and attain, so that they can help us get to that 2015 goal, 2050 goal, right, uh, of the climate crisis and so many others. I think in the same vein, though, part of what the challenge that I'm hearing, or at least feeling maybe myself in the room tonight, is that when steps outside of a process take place, one of the unintended consequences, I think, and I fear, is that well-meaning partners can feel the need to be competitive when instead what we need is collaboration. And I think staying in process is critical. That doesn't mean that every process is without need for adjustment or edit. I think, though, um, in the same way that uh, very beautifully you've laid out a plan to get from 2019 to 2050 uh, in a very, creating a much different climate for our globe, I think understanding the vast network of experts from a social service, from a social justice, from a human equity standpoint in this community, trying to create opportunities for these groups to be collaborative together will help us get to a much different place socially in 2050 as well as in the climate. Um, so I just want to recenter some of the discussion as well on the process and the need to stay within that as well. I thank you. Thank you, Adam. Anyone else? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else. Thank you, thank you everyone for speaking. Um, you know, speaking truth as you feel it and know it. We'll turn to item 11, planning and zoning matters. Some of you may want to depart, feel free. We'll just take a you know 30 second break or something. Well, that was all quite moving. I hope the planning and uh, staff can <laughs> rise to the occasion. <laughs> Only kidding. So uh, item 11, planning and zoning matters. Uh, item 11A, fringe area rezoning, Indian Lookout Road Southeast. This is a letter to the Johnson County Planning and Zoning Commission in support of a rezoning from County Agriculture A to County Residential R for approximately 2.43 acres of property located in unincorporated Johnson County at 4653 Indian Lookout Road Southeast. Could I have a motion to approve, please? Move. Some second. Moved by Sway, seconded by Thomas. Discussion, Danielle, good evening. Good evening, Mayor Danielle Sussman, Neighborhood Development Services, she, her, hers. This is an application to the Johnson County Board of Planning. It's a recommendation coming t from our planning commission to you tonight uh, and then being passed along to them. For a rezoning case that they're hearing for some property south of Iowa City, almost directly south of Iowa City along uh, Highway 218, generally east of Highway 218 and south of Power Chic, uh, Street Southeast, as shown here on the slide, outlined in white. The subject property is located in uh, one of our fringe area agreement areas, area C, outside the city's growth area. Um, as you'll recall, the fringe area agreement is a component of our comprehensive plan and is used to guide uh, these advisory positions that we take to the county when they uh, share their applications with us for review. Um, we do rely on that fringe area agreement largely for the principles that were negotiated there. 
Um, as I said, this is a, in a uh, area outside of growth boundary. The proposed rezoning is from county residential R to a county res uh, agricultural zoning, or sorry, county to, it's pre being proposed to county residential, which is a large lot, about one acre uh, size lot uh, development pattern. Um, Indian Lookout Road Southeast is a re residential cul-de-sac road already existing and it features several pre-existing large lot residences in the vicinity. Um, 2.43 acres of the parcel um, is uh, shown here for the rezoning. Um, if, it's, uh, if the rezoning is ultimately approved by the, count, the county, the applicant intends to build a single family home on the property. There's some surrounding land around that parcel uh, that has steep slopes and dense woodlands that make it difficult for development. Um, the part that is being requested for rezoning would be the um, subject redevelopment area. Staff has, while that, that the area with sensitive features is outside the proposed that current application, staff has encouraged the county to consider preserving their balance of the land um, as they proceed through the next step in their development process, which would be the subdivision step. Um, that application would also come eventually to this body. As a little bit of background, um, in September of this year, the, the county did go through an amendment process to their future land use map, um, where they did, uh, and designate, designate this property as appropriate for future residential development. Staff did write an advisory position uh, in support of that land use map change at that time this uh, late, late summer. Um, so staff did do a review of this application um, based on the county's comprehensive plan, which, uh, like I just said, was recently amended. Um, as I said, it is uh, in our fringe area agreement, Area C outside the growth boundary. However, our fringe area agreement is a little bit out of date, and so um, it hasn't kept up with the changes that the county made recently to their comprehensive plan and to their land use map changes. So we recognize that there's currently a conflict uh, with that uh, agreement. However, staff continues to work with uh, the county to uh, work through uh, an amended fringe area agreement, which would eventually come to you for uh, review. In the interim, we've uh, based our review based on some good uh, planning practices having to do with comparing the um, application to the applicable uh, long-range planning documents, also looking at the surrounding neighborhood, which is a large lot residence is existing, the existing public infrastructure uh, as far as there being paved road access, um, and the unlikely uh, repeated subdivision because of the uh, constraints in topography and landforms that's in the area. And as I mentioned, staff con continues to work with county planning staff to update the fringe area agreement. So um, as I said, this is a recommendation being made to the Johnson County Planning Commission. Uh, ultimately, the Johnson County Board of Supervisors makes this decision. So based on the consisti consistency of the county's future land use uh, map and surrounding land uses, staff did recommend um, approval of this application. At their November 7th meeting by a vote of six to one, the Planning Commission did recommend approval as, of this case as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but that concludes my report. Thank you, Danielle. Any so, questions so for Danielle? I'm just a little confused in terms of, is it just gonna be then one single family, even though we've seen lots that authorize up this to seven? This particular applicant is not proposing a subdivision themselves. This is just one lot for their own de development. There are other existing lots out there of other owners that, uh, in the vicinity. That One of those early maps sort of showed it. The yellow lots are already existing residential development, so. If it's if the county approves it and the developer or landowner changes their mind, though, this would authorize up to seven. Uh, so the lots. county's um, lot sizes are forty thousand square foot acre lots minimum. So I don't believe there's too much more land there for one or two lots. The constraint here is access. So the narrow northern tip is the only part with frontage off any kind of road. So we don't really think this would lend itself to more than one lot anyway. And this may be a future question that we'll need to ask, but as of right now, we have no um, assessment tool to assess the carbon impact in terms of additional driving at this point? Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Danielle. So, council discussion? Well, I've been a little bit of a voice in the wilderness on these types of developments. I don't like them. I think they're inconsistent with density. 
Um, I think you guys have had a very pragmatic view. Ultimately, it is the county's decision. Um, but I think these sorts of development that are auto-centric um, really are uh, continuing on essentially a carbon-based transportation model with additional trips. It's virtually impossible to do any um, walking for any services or anything like that. Um, to a large degree, this is going to be the county's decision. But I do think that this is precisely the sort of development that moving forward we should take a look at. So I'm not going to be supporting it, but ultimately it'll be the county's choice. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, Rockney, but I, th I think it's unrealistic for us to expect that everybody's going to live in the city. Um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to have some people, and I think one of the things that we need to look for and hope for is continued improvement in our technology so that our cars are not as polluting as they are now. Um, I think that's one of the things I read with the whole carbon and environmental thing is changes in technology or what are going to save us if anything does. And I think in the meantime, I, I just I don't think it's realistic that we expect everybody to live in the city. So. Maybe, but one quick just rebuttal to that is I think that if you're going to do rural developments, there are ways to do it that are denser and more clustered and not this. So that's only comment in there. Um, Except the people who live in the county don't want the density. That's they want those acre lots. That's why they're moving there. With, with all due respect, Rockney, uh, you talk density, but I mean, this is we're talking one, one residential home here, and uh, having in the past lived very close to this area, uh, right off of Old 218, it's a very quick jaunt, and also very quick, not very far from a bus route that's within the city limits, uh, and someone could bike to that uh, and put their bike on the bus and bus into town. It's it's probably within a mile, mile and a half of. of half mile within the city limits, so it's very close. Uh, so I, I don't see the concern for the carbon footprint on this being just one home and, and very close to the city limits and, and a bus line. The term I'm familiar with with regard to development in, in more rural areas that would, that would cluster development in one place and preserve other parts of properties is conservation subdivision design. Mm -hmm. And I know it's been used in the, the north sector of Johnson County in the past. I don't know how active all that is now. I haven't been tracking that, but that's the term I'm aware of. Fair enough. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to win this one. This but, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've made precisely your same point many times before, but any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. T? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Rob Morton? Yes. Cole? No. Motion carries six to one. Item 11B, zoning code amendment related to the riverfront crossings affordable housing requirements. This is an ordinance amending Title 14, zoning code of the Iowa City Code related to the riverfront crossings affordable housing requirements. I'm going to open. Let's see, get the hammer here. Open the public hearing. Danielle. Thank you, Mayor, Council, Danielle Sitzman, NDS. Um, in 2016, the city amended the Riverfront Crossings Code to include an affordable housing requirement that requires development containing 10 or more dwelling units on land zoned Riverfront Crossings to provide affordable housing dwelling units in an amount equal to or greater than 10% of the total number of dwelling units. Um, there are some terms defined there about what affordable means. Um, developers have the option to provide these affordable units in several different ways, including on-site, off-site, fee in lieu, or land contribution. Um, as we've um, implemented that code over the last several years, uh, we've noticed that there are some improvements that could be made to it that we consider to be minor. Um, this code change addresses a couple of those uh, at this time. First, amending the definition of affordable rental uh, housing uh, excludes certain uh, LIHTC uh, units from being counted in that way. Um, for example, the Delray uh, housing under construction now on South Dubuque Street is a LIHTC funded project and would, uh, we would like to make it uh, eligible to count those units under the affordability housing in Riverfront Crossings. In addition, the de definition of in income eligible households does not cap non-retirement assets. Um, without a cap, a household with substantial assets but a low annual income could qualify for an affordable housing unit. So the uh, proposed code changes seek to uh, address uh, that as well. As I said, fairly minor, uh, we would say cleanup items at this point as we've had a chance to kind of test the waters over the last couple of years. So um, next steps, this is being recommended to you tonight from the Planning Commission. Um, and they did meet and vote to uh, support the uh, two code changes. 
And I think if there are any questions, Tracy is also available to answer questions about affordability. That concludes my report. I have a question. When you looked at the non-retirement assets, was there any consideration given to looking at the level of retirement assets for people, for seniors? I mean, I, I can tell you I work in the financial services industry, and there are seniors who have very low incomes but are also very wealthy when it comes to their assets. It, I doubt that we probably run into many of them trying to take advantage of low-income housing, but it just popped into my mind when I saw this. Typically, we, we don't have that problem. Um, the folks that are applying to us for owner-occupied housing rehab programs are truly low to moderate income, living in houses that are probably below $200,000 in value. Um, we just have always had this, in our owner-occupied housing program, we've always had a $100,000 cap on non-retirement assets just to be consistent. What we were finding in Riverfront Crossings and what, what prompted this is that we got two applications over the last two years. One person had over $300,000 just in a savings. Another person had over $2 million in assets outside mm. their home. I'm sorry. Well, with the, exactly, <laughs> with the HUD passbook, passbook <laughs> savings rate, you can have a lot of assets, but very, that's not and, really and still be eligible. And that, that's um, not the intent of our, yes. so we just wanted to, to, while it's not ideal, we just wanted to make it similar to our owner-occupied, to be consistent with our owner-occupied housing program. Um, now your home, so if you're a, if you're a retired senior and you're living in a $125,000 home and you happen to own it, we don't count that asset mm -hmm. in that calculation um, because they're not selling it. We're, we're rehabbing that existing right. house. Now for down payment assistance or to, to purchase, we would consider the equity that you have in your home. So if you're gonna sell a $400,000 home and you have three hundred thousand dollars in equity, then then you won't be eligible for our programs. If that makes sense. But yeah, it does. I, it it just when I read the thing and it talked about non-retirement assets, I, we, I, I get yeah. the idea. That we you realize don't, that there's some that yes could have quite a yeah. bit in retirement assets. And it's I just, get the idea if somebody's under fifty nine and a half, you don't want to count those because one they don't have access to them, you know, without penalty. Plus the fact they're supposed to be there for retirement. Mm -hmm. But what popped in my head is the fact that it is possible to have people of retirement age with very, very large assets, not necessarily in their home, yet they have very low income because they don't have much in expenses. And so it just, it's another piece of it that we considered it. We just, okay. Yes. Mm. All right. Thanks. And not, it's not perfect, but we, yeah. we wanted to stop that. Sure. Two million dollar oh, asset right. person coming. No, I, I appreciate yeah. that. I, it's important. Are you, that, go ahead. Oh, Nicole. all right. For the owner, do they? Is this only related to owner occupied individuals, as far as like, or or is this also inclusive of rent individuals that rent? It'd be both. Rent so the, for, for the riverfront crossings, almost so far all of our projects have been rental. Rent. But we do have one that has requested to owner occupied. Um, for sale, home ownership for sale. Sure. So in that case, we wanted, and that was the application we got that they had $2 million in assets. So sure. we just wanted to to prevent that. We, we denied it because it didn't meet the intent of the, what we were trying to do, but we wanted to have something formal on our books. So I guess, um, and I read through this a couple of times um, because I wanted to make sure that I kind of understood uh, where you all were coming from and there's a little more clarity and uh, emphasis on um, you, you're wanting to keep it consistent. But the light tech, um, well, there's a few things about Riverfront Crossing um, and the 10 year afford um, affordability period that I've talked about, you know, for some time. So that isn't, you know, changing in any of this. And I think that it's vitally important that we have a conversation about what happens in you know, 15 years when the people move into this property and then, or even the 11th year, <laughs> they move into this property, this is the only neighborhood that they know, and then they no longer are eligible to remain in this property unless they have the resources to pay market value rent. So that is a major concern for me, um, and we need to have an in-depth con uh, conversation. It was concern for the committee that um, I think they met over a year or two um, when they were, they were coming up with the affordable housing requirement. And it was a concern that 10 year, for some it was too short. Um, I think what they decided for the financial incentives and how much they were gonna subsidize it and our fee and lieu cost, that that's what they agreed to at the time. 
Um, and and I, I, I actually applaud that it was even uh, something that came that, that was uh, achieved. I think that's great. Um, but again, there is a huge um, concern that I have just as far as like, um, it, it, it's, it's disturbing for families to be in the situation and then they have to move out and they won't be potentially in the riverfront crossing when they move out and they'll be in neighborhoods um, that they'll be forced to move to. But so that is one thing that's concerning to me. Um, the other, go right ahead. I just say what's nice, what, what prompted the, the LIHTC, the low income housing tax credit is we, if you transfer those to a LIHTC unit, that's a 30 year period of affordability. Yes. So we are kind of weighing that, that you know, that, that takes your tenure and now you have a 30 year compliance yes. period. And that's the first um, one that you were um, asking to amend. And, and of, of course, I was going to acknowledge that that's a 30 year from the tenure, which is great because you'll convert some of those over to the. So I, I, I think that's awesome. And that's definitely a move in the right direction. The hundred thousand dollar non-retirement asset, that to me seems very high. Um, extremely high um, and, and I guess I'm I just come from a world where affordable housing is a high need among so many people where they're still having challenges in Iowa City to even find availability so if we open it up to a greater in, income set um, there'll be people that I don't know that a, a, a individual, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, people have to sell their home and all that other stuff, but I mean, if you have resources um, and assets to me, if we're talking about, um, I think it was talking about property, that seemed like an investment, um, something that they don't occupy, either a business or rental property. So I'm not certain that with $100,000 that I'm comfortable with that. Right now, I am not supportive of this. Um, I would like to see a little more um, work done based on some of the things I just talked talked about. I know that our, our staff works hard at bringing people together and trying to come up with a great solution. Uh, this for me um, right now and this, um, I, I really do support the first one because LIHTC is taking it from 10 to 30 for the ones that you can kind of convert over. It's, it's the second amendment that I'm just not comfortable with, um, as well as that 10-year just overall. Yeah, I was trying to talk about the same thing, like for the 10-year. I thought when we can in, if we have a chance to change, like uh, we talked about the 10 years before that, uh, I don't know, we get, we're going to do another changing on the whole affordable housing you know, action plan, but I was just w wanted to see something, some king for the 10 years. Uh, also, I would like to ask you, what if you know the difference uh, in the actual, uh, the actual difference between the hard fair market rent and the low income tax credit? Depends on if you're talking about rent set at rent. 30, 40, or 60 percent median income. So, yeah, well. just, just like an idea for each one. Uh, hold on, hold on. I had it. Well, I can tell you from memory that the 30% LIHTC rent is under our home fair market rent, and it varies by bedroom size. Aha. So the home fair market rent for one bedroom is 684, 902 for a two bedroom, 1304 for a three bedroom. The 30% LIHTC rent for one bedroom is 538, two bedroom is 646, three bedroom is 746. I didn't write down the 40%, but typically in a LIHTC deal, you have you have so many units for 30%, 40%, and 60%. Um, the 60% is high. So for a one bedroom, it's 1,077, a two bedroom, it's 1,293, and a three bedroom, it's 1,493. So while cheaper than, it's all new construction, while cheaper than the private market, it's significantly higher than the home fair market rent. Whenever we open up a LIHTC project, typically what happens about 50% are, are filled with people with Section 8 vouchers. So they're paying that and then they're, so they're still only paying 30% of their income. It's kind of like the home program. Um, with CDBG, you can say it's kind of like a double subsidy. With CDBG, you can say 
I'm already going to reduce your rent to this much, so I'm not going to accept Section 8 so that you can, that person with Section 8 can, can lease another unit, so you're not kind of, you're spreading the number of affordable housing units out throughout the community. With home and LIHTC, you can't do that. So if someone has a uh, Section 8 voucher, they have to accept it. They can't say, no, we're going to reduce this rent like um, the 30, 40%. They still have to take it. So basically what we see in LIHTC properties is we see them fill up with a, a large uh, percentage of people that have Section 8 vouchers. So low-income people that utilize Section 8 vouchers, they do get new housing, they get new construction, which typically they wouldn't have, but the, that 60% rent is high. Mm -hmm. I really guess uh, don't like the, 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 the small thing that has been added. It's very nice to have this because we're going to have like kind of like more room for affordable housing for a long time. But, you know, I guess the code amended and it's not changing the 10 years. I guess second bros, what bros said, and I just don't like it. I, I get what you're saying about the 10 year. It probably is not the same conversation as this, though. It, if you want to amend the 10 years, that'd be something we'd have to have a committee yes. look over. Because you're also yes. amending how much money it takes and how much subsidy. So you might have developers opting for more of a fee in lieu of or We'd have to change the subsidy amount if you're, if you're going more than 10 years. And that um, is a huge conversation, yep. absolutely. Yep. So if the council wanted to, it could ask to have uh, put on the pending list uh, a discussion about uh, changing, I don't know, the, the duration to, from 10 years to, say, 20 years, and then yep. learning what the consequences yes. of that would be. And that, I, think, I think that would be a good idea. That's a more deliberate process. This uh, was seen as more of just clean up to address a, a couple of issues that we were seeing. And just to clarify, and maybe I'm not understanding it correctly, is this change required to um, facilitate, you know, LIHTC projects? I mean, are, are we trying to do it so we can help qualify for the LIHTC projects, yeah. or is it just it's not mainly to qualify just qualify it. Okay. It's an encouragement. We have that requirement in the Riverfront Crossings District. Already. So it isn't, okay. it's a, it's an incentive for a developer to basically say, well, I don't want to provide them on my property. You know, I don't want to do income certifications. I'm not prepared to do that level of administrative. But if I sell this property at a, a reduced rent or not to reduce, a reduced price that an affordable housing provider like the Housing Fellowship or something, they make that deal and encourage, and that's why they transfer their light tech over to. So then you get permanent affordability because even with yeah, the yeah. Delray okay. project, after 30 years, the housing fellowship plans to own that, so it's almost like permanent affordability. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I would encourage fee in lieu of because you're getting away from that 10-year and you're getting permanent affordability if an agency like the housing fellowship um, is a general partner or so in that way, I like, I like that. Now, typically that's for student housing. I like the fee in lieu when you have student housing. If this is not a student housing development, then I'd probably say I push for the, the on-site affordable housing. But the typical ones that we've been seeing so far in Riverfront Crossing have typically been in the student market. I'm just curious, and I hate to put you on the spot. I, I noticed that Billy um, Townsend was in the negative. Do you, do you recall at all what her reasons were at all? Mm -hmm. She had very similar comments to wanting to discuss the 10-year affordability period okay. with this as well. So okay. it was not so much the proposed changes, but just not going far enough. Okay. I would encourage we could have that conversation and we could set the 100,000. I'm just concerned about how much time because we have a project that want to convert to home ownership and if we mm -hmm. don't have some type of asset limitation now, we technically have no, yeah. you, you, can, you can have yes. a lot of assets and still qualify under HUD's calculation and we wanted to prevent that. So, so I would encourage of, something now, but to, can, we can always yes. revisit it and amend it. So one of my, and I know that that is a part of the vote tonight is, um, Right now it's without a cap and we need a cap. And so one of my hopes was to, I don't know what your time frame is, um, to either come back with something a little different if there was more um, counselors in favor of a lower, um, lower than 100,000. Um, I guess I would be willing if it is a time constraint to vote yes on this. I do know that the 10 year affordability, that's another conversation and it's very, um, um, I was happy to hear you talk about the hopeful options, even with um, maybe like um, LIHTC uh, agencies coming in and buying some properties and giving that 30 year. So I th we just need to have the conversation about the 10 year and that is different from this vote tonight. So I would be so, uh, supportive of this vote if right now you're saying it's more of a time constraint. I I'm just concerned with 
their project coming online and then wanting to sell units that I, I could have someone with 200,000 sitting in the bank and if I only if I have a passport passbook saving rate of 0.9% that person's going to qualify and that sure. I don't know if that meets the intent of it meets the HUD regulations but I don't think it meets your intent so I wanted something to not to say that we can't revise it if we have a committee, we're looking at the 10 year, we can also look at that asset. I just want something that if they bring me an application next month, I, I, I can the deny them is, on. The, the, what's on the table today um, is, is we feel comfortable is addressing the original intent of the ordinance. And, and we felt it was needed okay. to, so that the intent of the ordinance was properly codified. The, the expansion of the ordinance uh, to, to 20 years or, to you know, whatever else uh, you may have in mind, I, I think what you'd want to do is is look back really hard at how that ordinance was created and create a similar type of public involvement process because then you're fundamentally changing the policy, the the, the ordinance. You're not clarifying intent; you're fundamentally changing it. And as as Tracy mentioned. That was a very long and deliberate process where we've got a bunch of stakeholders together and probably for over a year met to come up with the framework. Not to say it can't be changed or it shouldn't be changed, but I don't think it should be changed in this type of context where we're just kind of bringing you some, some cleanup language. Yeah. So I would recommend you just pass this and then identify those things that, that you want to talk about and we'll, we'll put it on a work session. You can determine whether you want to move forward with those. And if you do, what type of uh, uh, process you want to put in place to vet those concepts? Makes sense to me. I, I just want to ask you again. I, maybe I miss it. Did you tell us how did you come with the one hundred thousand already? We've we've had it for some time. It's just in our owner occupied housing oh, program. Oh, it is yeah. Um, and to be honest, we hardly would ever get an applicant that even has that amount. Usually, <laughs> um, it'd be a rare situation. But it does give us a in case. The odd application we get, it gives us a case to deny that person and I prioritize see. other people that have lower incomes. But it would be, it is not common in our owner occupied housing programs to have anybody with that level of assets that applies to our program. And if later down the road, I guess I ask that to the city manager, if we change the, the 10, like 10 years affordability, this is what I would like to see too, right? Like the whole code, right? The owner, we have that provision amongst our owner-occupied housing program citywide. What you'd be changing is the riverfront crossings district. That's what I meant, yeah. 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 If we did, it would change the riverfront crossing, yes. and this would be included, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Things, yeah. Okay. We have a motion on the floor, and we still have a public hearing that's open. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Danielle. Anybody else want to address this topic? Like maybe Sarah Barron? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sarah Barron, Affordable Housing Coalition. Um, I, I recommend that you approve the changes um, that are suggested this evening. I think the trade-off for the LIHTC grants, while they won't be reachable for everyone, when LIHTC project does generate such a long period of affordability, that's a great trade-off. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, of course, always supportive of discussions about how we can strengthen the affordable housing and the lasting benefits from the riverfront crossings. Um, I do see them. As, as two separate issues, two separate processes, and I, I support staff's um, encouragement that we get this passed today so that we can prevent a misuse of the program as it stands right now. So we say vote yes. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I don't see anyone else, so are you folks inclined to support the Planning Zone Commission's recommendations? Yes. All right, yep. so I'm gonna close the public hearing. Move first consideration. Second. second. Moved by Mim, seconded by John. Did you? John, mm -hmm. yes. By, uh, um, seconded by uh, Thomas. Discussion. Well, I think I'm encouraged by um, some of the things that staff just talked about. And one is um, even though the 100,000 to me in, in theory seems very high, um, but overall what they're seeing in applications aren't close to that type of asset. So, um, and the other thing is um, consistency for the staff, because across the board, I, I think I got gathered that that 100,000, you know, limit is kind of what they're doing across, across the board. And so um, after the discussion, I don't see a need to uh, really make a, I, I will support it as it is. Um, and so I'll just say that. And uh, number one, um, you know, that they're talking about the light tech. I think, 
you know, the 30 year, that's going to be a very positive move in the right direction, direction within the riverfront crossing area. So I'm going to support this. Yeah, I just sort of view it as sort of this very outer sort of safety valve or trigger. And then if we, one number we didn't get is what is the average asset for someone applying is probably relatively low. So it's just the most extreme case. So mm -hmm. um, I don't think we need to change that. Any further discussion? No. Hearing none, roll call please. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. T? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Frogmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence from Cheryl Cruz? Move. Second. Moved by Soe, seconded by Teague. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 11C, zoning code amendment related to single family site development standards. This is an ordinance amending Title 14 zoning of the Iowa City Code related to single family site development standards. I'll open the public hearing. Hello, Tracy. I am going to give you a brief update about what's happened since oh, 2017 when the state prohibited cities from um, regulating occupancy based on familial status. So, let me see. Okay. So, if you look on, on the screen, that happened in April 2017. Um, we looked at an eye of, in response to those changes, in response to the state saying you could not do what we had been doing for years, we looked at what could we do to encourage safe and healthy um, neighborhoods, how can we maintain that, and how can we maintain their attractiveness to all of our residents, whether they be students, young families, empty nesters, or retirees. So we had a lot of thought process going into it. We did a lot of changes to our housing and zoning code. Um, I'm going to get to, thank you. <laughs> so we looked at our zoning code changes. So actually, I'm going to go to housing code. So first, in December of 2017, we looked at our housing code and what we could do. Um, at that time, we hired a full-time staff person to look at nuisance and go out to inspect. And Stan will get up a little bit later. Um, we have a full-time person. You'll see the number of violations and citations we're issuing. Issuing has increased substantially. We hired a full-time inspector to, to deal with the increased inspections. Um, we went from a two-year inspection cycle to a one-year inspection cycle for several properties, such as fraternities and sororities, group homes, single-family homes with more than four bedrooms, multifamily built before 1996. So instead of that two-year cycle, those, those, those properties are on a one-year cycle. To handle that load, we hired another full-time inspector. We annually budget for a half-time police officer, or neighborhood services office, to to handle neighborhood nuisance issues, especially on the off hours that we were not working that Monday through Friday um, during the day shift. We went through a lot of changes. So we defined a capital room and set minimum requirements, um, dimensions. So you can't have um, a room, like a habitable room, that's only 20 feet or square feet because everything else is bedrooms and you have this little parcel. We limited how much space bedrooms could take up in a single family or duplex to 35% of the finished floor area. We required interconnected smoke alarms um, if you're adding a one or more bedrooms and for new construction. We defined and set requirements for minimum shared living space. We required separate, um, separate a permanent separation between duplexes. We required deadbolt locks. We limited parking to the rear of the lot for single family and duplex properties. Then we followed that, uh, hold on. We followed that up and then in April of 2008 with zoning code changes to change the rear setback requirements so that you can't expand throughout your whole backyard. We limited the number of bedrooms in attached um, single family and duplexes. We op updated our private open space and we moved to annual inspections as I talked about. So between 2017 and 2018, oh, and with those zoning code changes, we implemented the rental permit um, the rental permit um, cap in certain neighborhoods in our downtown, which then in April of 2019, the state said we can no longer do. So we've had that rental moratorium in place. It expires March 7th of 2020. So the two regulations that we're going to propose to you, um, they go in, in conjunction with this. So they're not in separation. They're, they're going with the changes that we've made in 2017 and 18. Um, I also wanted to mention... Council set up with goals when we looked at what else could we do um, if we don't have a rental permit cap. And your goals were listed, these three. So 
the first, the radon ordinance will, will go into that healthy and safe living environments that I'll come back and discuss after the paving. The, the, the item that you're on right now addresses the second and third bullet points. Um, so we're gonna have Danielle and Stan talk about this issue, but that's, that's the, basically the history of what has happened today since 2017 when we are no longer could regulate rental properties by that familial status. Any questions so far? So with the exception of the rental cap restriction by the legislature, all of those other amendments are still in place and are place. okay. Yes. Yep. And, I, and I would say I think other cities that haven't had those previously are looking at those as responses yes. to the elimination of the rental cap. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the proposed code amendment that's not radon. Right this one has to do with the um, paving in the front yard. Um, this is to uh, require a nine foot separation distance between conforming parking spaces or parking space areas and, and any additional paving within the required uh, setbacks. So there's a couple of diagrams I'll walk you through. I think the important thing to, rec to realize is that we're simply adding on to the current uh, standard with some additional. Um, regulation. So um, I'll kind of do a, a current code analysis for you and then show you the proposed code. So uh, just to get you oriented, the, uh, the light blue box around this square is meant to represent a lot line. So this is somebody's private uh, property. The street would be somewhere down here below the bottom of the slide. So outside of this lot boundary, we would typically see sidewalk here and then this back of curb and the street down here. So think of this line as their property line. So we have a 15 foot front setback area, which is shown with just south, I suppose, of this dark line. This uh, set of uh, polygons is meant to represent the house on this lot, and these two squares are meant to represent driveway. So if this is a garage, for example, this is showing you that the current code allows for a parking space that leads directly to uh, that garage. Um, and then the standard is no more than 50% of this front setback area can be covered with um, pavement. That's the current standard. So under the current standard, you could build additional pavement in your front setback area. Um, that would meet the current code standards. It's okay as long as it's still less than 50% of that setback area. Unfortunately, the current code says you can't park there. Um, what we're seeing is that people do park there, and that's probably most of the motivation for paving that area is to create additional parking, which then allows the occupancy perhaps to be greater uh, or more enticing for a greater rental occupancy in the building. So in code enforcement, when we developed this, when we sat down to kind of brainstorm ideas for additional code uh, regulations that we could come up with. This was one that we uh, worked up, wrote up, in order to make enforcement easier for those code enforcement folks that Stan works with in the field who are trying to enforce an ordinance right now that currently says you can't park there, but it's a very enticing place to park if somebody's paved it for you. Um, the proposed code would basically allow still that paving but require a green space or basically not paving uh, essentially the width of a normal parking stall, so nine feet uh, separated from the driveway. So you might still be allowed to pave and, and do other things in that front yard setback area. It just would be less enticing and, and more obviously not for parking. Um, and also uh, make enforcement easier so that um, if somebody did uh, pave uh, in that area that we would know that that's just simply not allowed. Code enforcement wouldn't actually have to observe a car parked on the pavement to say that is parking. Simply the design of the parking would be a violation. So just for some illustration, that's that same box in a different area. Um, that would be allowed. Something like that would be allowed. Um, the, what we see here uh, oftentimes being built is something like this for people to park along the side of the building, that would be okay as long as they're not paving in this area. So um, there are many different kinds of houses out there oriented different ways on lots with different um, desires for paving in that front setback area. We've tried to write the code so that we're really just addressing the um, parking that we see as a violation or as a, a detriment to the neighborhood. So Stan's got a couple of pictures loaded up here so he can kind of illustrate this for you. Um, this is, I think, a good point to turn it over to Stan. Good evening. Stan Loverman, Senior Housing Inspector. Uh, some of these are probably pretty familiar to you as you walk by them on a daily basis, I'm sure. 
Um, this is on the north side. Uh, we've been told that this area to the left was paved for uh, barbecuing and uh, other areas for uh, the tenants. It appears that it's not being used for that. In addition, um, the parking has allowed uh, a double stack there in front of that garage. Again, uh, it, it just makes the, this house more marketable because of the available parking and even though it's not conforming and it doesn't increase the, the theoretical occupancy, it, it allows them to use that higher theoretical occupancy. Uh, again, this is a, an older design on the north side. Uh, this uh, ordinance would help uh, alleviate that as well. Um, property on the west side, um, it doesn't exceed the 50% of the yard. Um, technically, that's not parking, um, and this is what we're seeing has quite the detrimental effect on the neighborhood. Um, here's an older one that's right off of Dubuque Street. Uh, those cobbles have been there a long time. Uh, they may have expanded, uh, again, not being used for their intended purpose. Uh, again, another one on the west side, an example of uh, a parking spot that was uh, a spot that was definitely added for parking. Any questions? I have questions about the duplex that you showed. I, yep. Can you just explain that parking or concern there? So over time, um, this the parking has, or the paving of this has expanded. Um, so the, the paving between the, the curb and the sidewalk uh, probably wasn't done under permit. Um, the orientation of the sidewalk probably has been incorporated into the driveway in a different way over time as well. So this would only be prospective. We wouldn't go back and be able to force them to change. Not right? at this time. Which is nope. prevent future. Correct. Stan, we're, so all of these photos are taken within what I sometimes think of as the university impact zone? Um, yes. Yeah, it would be. Yep. The, the ordinance is would apply to the city as a whole. Correct, yep. Do we need to apply it to the whole? Uh, it seems to me the, the problem is not citywide. I, I think you see pressure um, in areas that would exceed the university impact area. Uh, so west of on Benton uh, in the Sunset uh, Greenwood area, there's parking pressure on those um, streets or wild green, excuse me. I mean, there's there's a lot of parking pressure on there, and I, I think if you if you don't address it now, so there there could conceivably yes, yeah, that's a high demand for you know student housing at this time. I really want explanation again for this. I couldn't understand it when you when Bruce mentioned it. This parking in front of the garage and uh, all the pavement. Uh, the, the concrete is in front of the either the side the, the walking from the house or in front of the garage that typically like what I have in my house with the problem here exactly uh, the parking this exactly. here this is added um, this how this sidewalk is incorporated into that um, drive that's that's expanded over the time from when this was built but they could not do that that's just like a side, side work from the house to get out they could do this in some fashion. This, uh, under current design, this area could not be paved, um, and then you would have to design this differently as well. You can't, this has over 50%. This is an older design. This is, just has over 50% of the front yard oh, uh, okay. in concrete as well. But the, the parking of the cars as such is, is okay, because two The per parking garage, of the cars is fine. It's just yep, that extension correct. of the drive yep, that right. takes up yep. over 50% of the, of the green space. Correct. Right. And when well, you're really, it, go ahead. Uh, excuse me. It, I mean, it looks to me like on the right-hand side, if you look at the gap between that white car and the next car, you've got room for another whole car in between. So while you can't tell it from this photo, it looks to me like there's got to be paving way over to the right-hand side mm -hmm. past that garage on the right as well. And really what you're trying to do is to prevent a ton of parking lots and front yards Correct. in addition to excessive density. Right. So I'm wondering how the amendment will help us achieve the second of the three goals we set back in May, namely maintain neighborhood characteristics and housing options suitable for a diverse demographic in the city's older single-family neighborhoods. Sure. I think if you look at this picture, um, this 
uh, type of situation does not appeal to uh, young families, uh, families that are looking or uh, people that are looking to live in their first home. Um, this to me says student housing. It appeals to just one demographic. We're looking for housing that appeals to uh, a large demographic, a, a diverse demographic, and I don't think this does. Like for something like this, do they come and ask the city if they want to do this or do they just go ahead and do it? They do it. Oh, really? <coughs> and then what? <laughs> At this point, it, it doesn't exceed 50% of the uh, front yard, so it, it's permitted. It, not in parking, uh, but then it becomes an enforcement issue where we have to um, identify it um, and, and it becomes a, an issue that we take to court and it, it becomes cumbersome to explain because our code also says you have to be parked on a dust-free surface. Well, this is a dust-free surface, so then it becomes that component that you can't park in your front yard. So. It's very nuanced and it's it's hard to enforce. So, let's say that um, those cars weren't parked there on yes. the side, and um, mm -hmm. that was intended maybe for a grill or whatever. Sure. Let's say there was it was grass again. Yes. So the the um, the driveway that leads back to the yes, would cars have to be 15 uh, feet set back? No. Um, or can they park up to the grass. sidewalk? They can park up to the sidewalk sidewalk because as long as you're leading to a conforming spot which this is a conforming spot okay that's parking you can mm -hmm. double stack there okay. oh, yeah. so we would count two spots you could probably fit three cars in there but we would count two cars as conforming parking which would give you an adult occupancy of three people in that house okay mm -hmm. so the let's say the the black car that's in front i i think that was one well in the diagram that danielle showed uh, before just with the colors and such. Uh, in, in front of the house, there was a, well, right now to the right of the house, there, there could be pavement and it could be parking. Correct. And then there was one going horizontal in front of the house, that one. Correct. That can be parking? That can't be parking, that no, can but it be. can be paving because you can have 50% of your front yard paved. Okay. But this kind of gives you an idea that this could be used as a patio or a grilling area or a place for bikes or... Now, would that need to have that uh, separation of, of nine feet? No. No, nope. that would not. No. Nope. Okay. All right. On the west side, I've noticed a lot of the single family homes are, are being uh, rented uh, to students, large numbers of students. Sure. And the student population these days, a number of them are uh, using the, the motor scooters and, and motorcycles. How does that play into this? Is this just motor vehicles? Because they oftentimes will park in the grass or off to the side with another cement slab. Yeah, you, you can't uh, be that. parking uh, motor scooters or motorized vehicles in the grass or in the front yard either. Oh, okay. But again, it becomes a, an enforcement issue. Uh, it's not as simple as writing a parking ticket either. It's a violation of our zoning code, which is a municipal citation, which involves uh, court time and <laughs> city attorneys, and um, it becomes a uh, yeah cumbersome. And if we amended this today, why not? This is not applied to the people already. Done Correct. This. Nope. This is just moving from forward. now on, on moving, moving forward. forward. Okay. So I have a question that may be for Danielle, I'm not sure, but with regard to the staff's meeting with the neighborhood council, I'm wondering who attended the meeting or maybe how many people were and how were they from all over the city or just a small part of the city? And, and was this proposal part of the discussion? Um, we uh, can't remember. We had probably three or four people from neighborhood development services. I attended the meeting. It was here in this, in this council chambers. Um, and it was really a listening session for us. So no, we didn't forward any proposals at that time. Um, we were really just asking the neighbors to, to comment on um, uh, what their observations were in their neighborhoods and what their concerns. I think largely, uh, surprisingly to us, we heard um, most of the concerns were on landscaping standards and and the need uh, or, or maybe the, the benefits that enhanced landscaping uh, can bring to a neighborhood um, and, and overall property maintenance, but paving was not one that I think we heard in that meeting. That's right, I remember that. Okay, 
Any other questions for Stan or Tracy? Or I just have one last one. Um, Maz asked the question about we won't be going back and making people, but here they can't park there. That's at correct. All. So that's correct. So there will still be enforcement. That's correct. We just won't make them change their. That's correct. Okay. This property owner has told me that he's putting a bike rack there, so we'll see. Oh. <laughs> so bike racks are, would be allowed. That's correct. Yeah, oh. not a motorized vehicle. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. Great. Thanks. Or barbecue. Right? Problem is, we have to continually. Go by that property. Yes. Look and see if oh, I know. <laughs> site, I site know. them. Site. You know. Sure. sure. Thank More you. More work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're still in public hearing mode here. Is there anybody else who would like to address this topic? Hi, Nancy. My name is Nancy Carlson. I live at 1002 East Jefferson, and I'm not sure whether this is the appropriate time or if you should finish this. I have a related, a major concern that is related to this, but it is not dealing specifically with this. So if it, you would feel more comfortable in finishing this before I present my concern, that's fine. Well, I don't know when you would present your concern. So why don't you state it and then just and then we'll move on probably, but state your concern, Nancy. Please don't go into great detail because you just told us it's not on target with regard to this particular ordinance. My concern is a construction that's going on at 938 East Jefferson right now. It was a small house. The house is being moved and an addition is being put on. It was a two bedroom house. It is being turned into a seven-bedroom, seven-bathroom house. I'm sorry. This is not something that I ever thought would happen in my neighborhood. Here's the diagram of the floor plan, the site plan, the whole thing. It is now, because of our zoning code, it is completely legal. Okay. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence, please? So moved. moved. Second. By Cole, seconded by Teague. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. What's the address again, Nancy? 38 East Jefferson. It is completely legal because it is a small house on a large lot. There are numerous small houses on large lots. Yeah. Any of these could be developed in this way. The other sad part about it is these small Can't Maybe you should go up to the. Yeah, go up to yeah, the. Sorry, yeah. yeah. The other sad thing about it is that most of these are affordable units that a n n various kinds of people can rent. This house at one point was rented by a lady in a, the writer's workshop. At one point it was rented by two uh, workers from one of the factories. So it, it, it can play out in a lot of different ways. Seven bedrooms, seven bathrooms. There is one audience that they're going for. So we are losing affordable housing. It's going to make affordable even more less than we all, what we already have. It does not stable, do anything to stabilize our neighborhood. Okay, thank it's you for bringing this to our attention, Nancy. I hate hearing it. Okay, so... Uh, is there anyone else who was going to address this in public hearing? Seeing no one, are you folks inclined to support the commission's recommendation to approve? Yes. No. Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Move first consideration. Second. Moved by Mem, seconded by Cole. Discussion? Well, I'll just say that, you know, Nancy gave a good example of. Um, it appears that with our current code, uh, there's still opportunities to build 
houses, which I would, I would argue are not at all consistent with our, our second goal in particular, maintaining neighborhood characteristic, characteristics and housing options suitable for attracting a diverse demographic in the city's older single family neighborhoods. So it seems we have some serious loopholes with our, with our current code that allow, you know, we had this major blowout over um, the Lusk House in Manville Heights. The, this, especially if you think, consider the possibility of the number of properties where this could happen, um, it could have a very significant impact and essentially preempt any possibility of pursuing something that I've been advocating for for years, which is, and we had Opticos come in and study of the, the missing middle. I mean, in a sense, this is an up zone. This is taking a house which, you know, in a conventional house of, or property that you would find in the central neighborhoods, you'd find three to four occupants. Here, here we have seven. And so, what I've been trying to advocate for is yes, I, I think it's possible on these larger lots to, with missing middle, um, increase the occupancy, but it would be in more than one unit. So you, you achieve the same outcome in terms of density, which I think is something we all support for various reasons, including you know our climate action, particularly because this is a walkable neighborhood. So your transportation costs are dramatically less. However, it's not, you know, we're, we're in fact increasing um, housing options for a specific demographic which is already at, you know, just single family duplex properties alone in certain neighborhoods over 50%. So um, my concern is we're just not there yet in terms of yeah. addressing the... Yeah, fair, sure. So it, it's off topic. It is the, off topic, but it's related to. Yeah, uh, you're right, but it's off topic. So, uh, council discussion about the topic at hand. We had a lot of discussion. I'm supportive of the changes that staff has recommended. Yeah, it seems like an experience-based solution to something that staff is observing in the field, and I think any time we can facilitate code enforcement in a way that improves livability of the neighborhoods, we need to do that. Any other discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Paul? Yes. Sims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Motion carries 7 to 0. Item 12, rental permit radon testing. This is an ordinance amending Title 17 entitled Building and Housing. Chapter 5, entitled Housing Code, to require radon testing and mitigation in single-family and duplex rental units. This is first consideration. Could I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Taylor, <laughs> second by Mems. Discussion. Tracy. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> um, oh. This ordinance applies to that goal of regarding healthy and safe homes that in our single-family, detached, and duplex properties. It goes really well with the work that we've done for Invest Health about improving indoor air quality and making homes safe for everyone. Um, there's 2,700 single family and duplex properties in Iowa City. And radon is a odorless, tasteless, tasteless gas. Um, it's based on um, radium, is it radium decaying in our soil. Um, it typically comes up through the basement. It gets trapped in the house and sometimes you have um, what could happen is levels that are over a threshold that the EPA and the state sets as a um, safe or an acceptable level. Um, it is the number one cause of lung cancer among non-smokers in the United States. And unfortunately for Iowa, we are in zone one, which is called the red zone. So that means all of Iowa will test higher than any other place. Well, we have a higher likelihood of having radon in our homes than you see in non-red zone areas. Um, the average indoor radon concentration in Iowa is more than six times the national average. So when we see single-family homes, owner-occupied homes being sold, it's typical. You see that it's part of the, the purchase agreement, one of those contingencies that you have to test for radon. You test for radon. If it's above that threshold, you will see the purchase agreement saying you have to mitigate it. Um, and, and typically that's what happens. 
in the rental market, we don't see that as often. So rental properties typically go without radon mitigation. So what this ordinance would do is to get a valid or to get a rental permit or to renew your rental permit, you would have to test radon. If it tests above a threshold, you'd have to install radon mitigation. And then you'd have to test every eight years. So testing, um, we test in all our university um, homes. We've tested in a lot of our owner occupied homes. They run us about 125 bucks for testing. So over eight years, 125 bucks every eight years if you're testing below that threshold. I would estimate based on our experience with university and our owner occupied homes, probably a little less than half will test positive with higher radon levels. So those folks would have to hire a radon mitigation system. Back in 2002, we switched our housing code. So basically if you're new construction after 2002, you have a pass passive radon system. So that means if radon levels can fluctuate over time. So at some point, if your home tests above that threshold, you already have the system and you just need to put the mechanical portion in it. So that, that it costs you far less, but that's only for homes built after 2002. Um, what you're seeing in a lot of our core neighborhoods down to, it's a lot of older neighborhoods. Um, you might have different types of basements that do allow radon to, to come in more easily. So once again, so to get your rental permit, we'd accept a test that's been done in the prior two years. If it tests fine, then you're good for another eight years, which is a four year cycle or two, four two year cycles for us. You'd have to get it tested again. And if you, like I said, if you exceed that threshold, you'd have to put radon mitigation in. That was a question. And how often you, you the rent department is for how long? I forget that. Typically two years, except two for years. Those, those properties that get tested on an annual basis. Sure. And if they test on and it's okay, they can just next year they can just provide the same test, right? For after if they two test, years. If they test okay, they don't have to retest for another eight years. Okay, sure. I mean, radon levels can fluctuate, especially if you put in a new HVAC system or if you do significant rehabilitation. But we figured we'd catch that about every eight years. So you would retest. Um, and like I said, we pay between $125, $150 per, per unit on testing. So over that eight year period, um, the cost is minimal. However, if you do test higher than that threshold, we will require radon mitigation. And that expense will vary based on if you have a pay passive radon system or if you have to put it in brand new. And then the cost can vary. So for a lot of our university or single family homes, it's been about $1,100, $1,200. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to quote a, a, an actual price because it depends on where you have to go, how you have to vent it. So that, that can vary in every, well, each home. I, I was really glad to see this ordinance, mm -hmm. I think, uh, just to ensure the health and safety of, of uh, occupants of the rentals. And uh, you'd mentioned the older homes, and uh, I think some of our very vulnerable populations live tend to live in the older homes because they're less expensive to rent, and, and that puts them at great risk. And in the article uh, that was uh, enclosed, it mentioned like 400 deaths per year in Iowa related to lung cancer, quite likely from radon. And, and that's, that's just way too many, granted. It's not just the Iowa City area statewide. But uh, as you'd said, it's colorless as old as we don't know that. And, and this hopefully is going to help reduce that number. Um, I think the ordinance does say if you have a habitable room in the basement, you would have to test more frequently if you, mm -hmm. um, just what? because your, your, your exposure increases in, in basement dwellings. And that's one question I, I kind of had. Um, uh, so every eight years is kind of the standard, but then... Well, <laughs> <laughs> that was a compromise, because if you talk to the University of Iowa and some of the, the folks that study radon, they wanted testing every two years. Sure. But from a capacity standpoint, administrative standpoint, and a cost, you're kind of balancing affordable housing with the cost and our administrative capability. We went with eight years. Um, no. Two years would be, that'd be a lot. <laughs> and then what, um, what happens if someone is like under, but just under? You know, they, they meet or, that threshold, so they, they wouldn't have to test for eight years. So yeah. eight years would be the yep. next time. Yeah, the, the state, the Department of Public, I think it's Department of Public Health, and EPA sets that level. Sure. So if you're under that level, you won't have to test for another eight years. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, any other questions? To test, yes. Thank you, Tracy. Anybody else want to address this topic? Council discussion? I guess think this is really important. And I'm glad that our city is moving to, like forward to do this kind of things. That's really a good move by the city. Thank you for the staff. I think when I first heard about this, um, it was just we talked about testing when they first got a permit, at least that was my understanding. But to 
you know, when I was reading and, you know, it's the 88 years and that type of stuff, I think um, we needed that. So I appreciate staff moving forward with that. Any other discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Frogmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Sully? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Could I have a motion to accept correspondence from Bill Field, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mims, seconded by Teague. Um, that works. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 13, Deer Management, mm -hmm. Firearms and Parks. This is an ordinance amending Title 10, entitled Public Ways and Property, Chapter 9, entitled Parks and Recreation Regulations, to allow persons to carry firearms in parks for the purpose of killing deer pursuant to a deer management plan. This is a uh, second consideration, but staff has requested expedited action. I move that the rule requiring the ordinances must be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended, that the second consideration and vote be waived, and that the ordinance be voted on for final passage at this time. So moved. Second. Sorry. I'm moved by Mem, second by Thomas. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Frogmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Keith? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Move final passage at this time. Second. Moved by Mem, second by Cole. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Frogmorton? Yes. Cole? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. T? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. Item 14, annual urban renewal report to the state. This is a resolution approving the fiscal year ending 2019 annual urban renewal area report. Could I have a motion to approve, please? Move. Second. Okay. Moved by Soleil, seconded by Teague. Hi, Wendy. Hi, good afternoon. Good evening, ah. I guess, <laughs> Mayor and Council. <laughs> You have a couple of items before you tonight, um, both regarding TIF. The first one here, um, item 14, um, is the annual report to the state of Iowa on our um, urban renewal areas. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Unable to connect. Okay, here we go. Thank you. There we go. Um, this item is um, about the annual state re report on our urban renewal areas, all the projects within, this, their status, and the status of any TIF accounts that we have, any debt associated with our projects, and that sort of thing. If any of you really tried to look into that 50, I think, seven page report, you know that it's thick to say the least. Um, we could probably answer your questions, but even the finance department and those of us that look through that, uh, that document um, to prepare it are troubled by its organization. But suffice it to say, we can still answer your questions on that. <laughs> Um, I think probably one of the um, most salient points to take away from TIF would be uh, the chart I'm showing up here that was also in your packet, which really gives the big picture of our TIF projects. Essentially, this shows you what the new value created by our TIF projects is. And the way you figure that is by taking the original value of a property and subtracting that from the current value of the property and you get the difference. And in our case in Iowa City, we've listed all of our TIF projects up here. There are a lot of dates and and um, valuations showing here, but we can say that we have a net 164 uh, million dollar increase in valuation um, over the original 26 million dollar uh, valuation for those projects. That's about a six-fold increase in, in valuation and originally had those properties not improved from the 26 million originally, um, we would see less than a million dollars in property tax revenues from those particular parcels. Um, 
annually. Uh, but now we're realizing about $5.4 million in annual property taxes from these projects. And many could argue that these projects wouldn't happen but for um, the city's assistance with tax increment financing. So looking at the value of the leveraging of the city uh, public funding um, and how it can increase the uh, property tax revenues in general, um, in a sense, helping with property tax relief for our residents is pretty impactful when you look at it like this. Those were my comments on this particular item. a helpful chart. Thank you, Wendy. Any questions for Wendy? Some of these properties are still on the rebate period, correct? Yes. So they're not actually generating tax revenue because they're, they're paying off the... Uh, they, while they may be getting rebates, the increase in property uh, value um, and the taxation on that includes a protected debt. So instantly, even while there's a rebate going on, there is an increase in property taxes coming into the city revenues. But what is, do you know what, is it a typical percentage or does it vary from It property? varies from year to year and it all depends on the taxing entity's um, uh, debt levies. It, it averages somewhere around, I think, 20 to 24% of the full taxing levy. And they continue to pay taxes on the base value of the project too, even during the course of the rebate period. Definitely. Don't they? Mm -hmm. okay. So that's not lost. Wendy, uh, a little over two years ago, you produced a pretty valuable PowerPoint presentation about TIF, and that presentation included some graphs that were pretty instructive. Uh, it might be fruitful for you to arrange to be able to, or with, with Jeff's guidance and all that. Uh, present that to the council again. I'm not sure that Maz and Bruce have seen it, and I don't think, I don't know about Laura and, and Janice, I, that they may not have seen it. It would be helpful probably for them. Well, it's fortuitous that I just updated those slides, so I'd be happy to do that anytime. <laughs> it's like put in a packet, right? Well, you know, but then you have questions, and what do you do with the questions? But, but, but I don't know, what, whatever would be the, the, the newest and new council members would find valuables, which ought to do. Hey, I will love to have those. Feel free to contact me, and we're happy to arrange that, whether it's TIF or any other type of operational um, questions that you have, we're always happy to arrange that. Right. Um, I did have a great presentation, yeah. so. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you, Wendy, for all this information. Yes, 55 pages, that's, that's a lot of data information. And uh, surprisingly, something caught my eye in all those pages, uh, just because it's in, in my neck of the woods, the Riverside Drive Urban Renewal Project. And, mm -hmm. and the one item uh, that's been kind of out there for a long time was the Riverside Drive Tunnel. And I wasn't sure where we were with that. And um, is there any impact on, on anything if, if we don't do this project? or? Uh, no, um, the the report is set up um, as, as our urban renewal area is set up to be able to collect tax increment for that project when and if it materializes. So um, we haven't collected anything for that at this point. So it's an it's an approved project in your urban renewal area. Thus, we can use increment to help fund that. We're not to the point where we can actually move forward on that project yet, but if we get there, when we get there. When we get there, we'll, thank we'll, you. We'll be able to at least consider the use of uh, tax increment financing dollars. I think that'd be a good thing because we'd encourage the development in riverfront crossings with the apartments and, and multifamily uh, areas there with the intent that we were going to make it easier for people to, right. to travel there. <laughs> so. Yep, that intent's still there. All right, yes. good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Wendy? Thank you, Wendy. Oh, and I wanted to say that the 57 pages couldn't have happened without the finance department, Dennis Bockenstedt yeah. and Jacqueline <laughs> uh, Flegel as well. I certainly can't take <laughs> very much of that credit. <laughs> Thanks. Not that you wanted to. Stop, Dennis. <laughs> take a bow, Dennis. All right. Uh, anybody else want to address this topic? Well, I would just comment that it, I think that first chart with that $164 million is something that we have to keep reemphasizing to the community that that 
we're leveraging money when we do these TIF projects, and we still are way, way below what we're permitted to do by state law in terms of how much property in the city is is TIFed. And so um, while some of it, yeah, is still in that rebate <coughs> process, as John mentioned, you know, the more time goes by, you know, more of those are, are back um, contributing fully to the tax revenues of the community. And, and I think, you know, as we've talked before, we've got a pretty good process here that these are but for um, that with the gap analysis, it shows that these projects would not go forward if we did not um, assist them financially from the city. So I feel really good about how conscientious and deliberate we are with the process and the results that we get from it. Any other council discussion? Oh. Hearing none, roll call, please. Paul? Yes. Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion carries 7 to 0. Item 15, annual TIF certification to the county. This is a resolution directing the filing of TIF certification under Iowa Code Section 403.19 for the 2019 end of year certification of urban renewal projects. Could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. Second. Moved by ma'am, seconded by Cole. Discussion, Wendy? This is the annual um, certification to the county auditor. And this is done every year, right around budget time like now, um, so that uh, the, auditor, the auditor knows how much of the tax increment to uh, either pull out and divert for our projects or not. And the way we communicate that is through this series of forms. We have a Form 1, a Form 2, and a Form 3. And uh, depending on the project and, and depending on expenses that have, um, that have occurred during the year, um, then we will certify to um, either initi initiate the collection of taxes for the first time, or if not that, in a project that's already underway, to specify a, a dollar amount other than uh, might be directed in the development agreement with the auditor, or form three to end the collection of taxes on a, on a particular project. Any questions for Wendy? I don't hear any. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, anybody else want to address the topic? Apparently not. Discuss, council discussion? Silence comes over the land. Could I have a roll call, please? Mims? Yes. Salee? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Teague? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Throgmorton? Yes. Yes. Motion carries 7 to 0. Item 16, council appointments. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. So we need to make appointments to, was this four? Five commissions, boards or commissions. The first is the Board of Adjustment. We have one vacancy to fill a five-year term, and uh, this actually well, the gender balance isn't right. until December 30th, and we only have the one application, so which is a male, right? So we really <coughs> should defer on this until the first meeting in January, unless we get some female applicants, then we could put it back on. Okay, so do we need a motion to do that? No. Okay. All right. The next item is the Climate Action Commission. And again, we have a, a gender balance requirement. No, no, yeah, that's right, we do, don't we? Yeah, three female requirement. But I, I can't remember where I saw this, but my recollection is that we were, there was an intention to appoint someone from the school district, someone from the Chamber of Commerce, and somebody from, I don't know, Johnson County, or was that just sort of, sort of informal text somewhere? Anybody that, that Well, that makes things discretion. easier. Yeah, okay, thanks. I don't know where I saw that. Uh, so let me kind of get that off of my thing here. Okay, so uh, it's a three female requirement. I, I'd r recommend appoint, uh, appointing uh, Betsy's, uh, Becky Soglin and Blake Roop, both of whom are female. I, I agree with Becky because she'd mentioned the county and she's the sustainability coordinator for Johnson County, so that'd be good to have her on board. 
Yeah, and I recommend Roop because he works in the Office of Sustainability. She. She, University. she I'm sorry, uh, in the Office of Sustainability. And I've talked to various people and heard many good things about Blake over the past year or so. I would agree with those two. Uh, without objection, we'll, we'll put them on the list here. So i make a list, Jim. So that'd be Sagan. I was also thinking that uh, that Grimm, uh, what's his first name? Um, oh, Benjamin Grimm would be a good appointment, but Benjamin is a male. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he comes from the school district. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good, uh, he's got a great background and a lot of good sort of um, um, complementary skills. So I want to toss it out there and see what y'all think. You need three females. I was going to say, can we? But well, we no, to. but uh, what, yeah, so what, I guess what I meant is do, do we have to, if we have a point, a female appointee or applicants, we have to appoint three females. Three. If, right? if the female right, sorry. is, if I, you I, de say yeah, the female's yeah, qualified. Thank you. Yes. Please disregard what I said then. I, I liked what Casey Hutchinson had to say. Um, she seemed to have a pretty good um, knowledge and feel for the mission uh, of, of the commission. Um, works with soil and water uh, conservationist coordinators, been in Iowa City a long time. Uh, I would agree with that, Pauline. Yeah, but she's also from Johnson County. Mm. Okay. So it'd be two representatives from the work for the county, county government. That's true. I, 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 I think I would recommend, uh, where's their first name, Madeline Bradley. If, if, yeah, if we're not doing the Casey, I would support Madeline. I'd support Madeline. In part, it's because of her experience in at the University of Oslo, Europe's green capital of 2019, and her work for Table to Table and I See Compassion. She founded Students for Refugees, uh, and so on. So. That's fine. That sounds good. All right. So, uh, are you all comfortable with appointing uh, what's her name, Madeline uh, Bradley? Yep. Yep. Okay. So we have three people: Sagan, Roop, and Bradley. Could I have a motion to uh, appoint them, Mayor, please? Yeah. Just real quick, I just want to make sure you're aware. You can certainly move forward, but um, uh, Miss Roop works for the university as well in the same office as their university appointment. Um, uh, stratus. Stratus. Yes. Thank oh, well, you. I looked at the list yeah. of existing members and I did not see. Stratus Stratus's is the uni University of Iowa appointed Perfect. rep. Remember, that's not a council appointment. That's a we rely on the but university. Yeah, I didn't even see it on the list. So it's okay if you want to move forward with that. I just wanted to make make sure you were aware, given the okay. comments yeah, about a couple not, county folks. We should not have two appointees from the university's mm -hmm. office of sustainability. Thank you. I agree. So we need uh, another person. Could, could be. Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, is are we? Is Casey just not a, an option because of the Johnson County? I mean, they're representing. I mean, they have two different. Appears to me fields of interest. But. We could appoint her if we wanted to. I mean, the, the, the soil and water conservation, I think, are important aspects of the uh, climate action, it's just given her specialty. Uh, okay, would you all like to appoint, what's her name again? Casey Hutchinson. Casey Hutchinson. Sure. I'm fine with that. That's fine. All right. What I'm hearing then is that we want to appoint Sagun, Hutchinson, and Bradley. Right. Could I have a motion to appoint them, please? So moved. Second. 
Moved by Thomas, seconded by Cole. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, the Human Rights Commission. We had, what, 26 applicants yeah. for three three-year terms, and there's a two male and one none, no, one no gender requirement. So uh, Ashley Lindsay, um, Lindley, um, when reviewing her application, um, she would go on to the none <laughs> um, because there's two males. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that I liked about um, Ashley's application, it's um, when it talked about your knowledge about the advisory board and you know, um, or the commission, um, they work toward equitable community within Iowa City and just some of her past experiences, um, just working with the youth um, through United Action for Youth, uh, just some of those um, working with parents as well within that program, the domestic violence intervention program. She served as a, a campus date and violence educator and also the LGBTQ plus um, Leadership Institute. Uh, she graduated from the One Iowa program and One Iowa is the, uh, was the, a, a real driving force behind uh, marriage equality within Iowa. And so just looking at um, Ashley, I, I found her application to be one um, that can really benefit um, the commission having her voice on there. So I did want to um, just uh, put out their consideration for her. I would second that recommendation. I think Mark Carolyn Garski also, I'm trying to, we have so many, it's hard to, it's, really it's, hard. it's yes. hard to go back and find them again. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to look at hers. I, I liked her, Susan, because she talked about how she's followed the activities of the HRC, she's attended the program, she's mm -hmm. been to some mm -hmm. of the meetings. I, I liked that comment that she's obviously knows what she'd be getting into. Yeah, I thought she was a pretty strong candidate as well. She's worked at, w, at RAC, Resource and Action Center. Um, served as an assistant in the UI Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. Um, so I thought she was pretty strong also. As far as male uh, candidates, I know that Mark Priest. Yeah, I was going to mention him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I strongly support Mark. Former pastor at Zion Lutheran, retired. I like Mark also. He, he also said that he uh, attends, has attended events, and is familiar with the commission. Who was that? Uh, Mark Priest. Mark. I thought Jason Glass brings maybe a little different perspective than some of the people he's worked a lot um, with his HR background, so been very, very involved in um, the corridor in terms of promoting um, events and equity and inclusion in the employment area. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I thought he was um, was a very strong candidate as well. So, he also so had served on the Iowa Human Rights Board yep. um, and talked about his passion for civil rights. So. Yep. So I liked what he had to say. Mark and Jason then for the two men. I'm okay with that. Yeah, those okay. would be great candidates. All right, so we have two female. Well, we have two females who have been recommended. Uh, does anybody want to propose another man? Because it's possible another man could be appointed. I, I'm not pushing it. I just want to know. Well, actually, I did. Um, I mean, I wasn't thinking that way. But another one that I had marked on the male side, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, Adadeo. Oladella Ayosa. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm struggling here with the name pronunciation. Um, I was impressed with his application as well. And again, trying to scroll through to find it again. Um, also, uh, mm -hmm. Well, my notes tell me he's 23 years old, uh, a black male, five-year resident of the city, mm -hmm. former intern with Kingsley Botchway, mm -hmm. and works as a nurse assistant. Well, so yeah. what, what do you know, know tell you about, uh, I can't pronounce the name, Venkatesha? Because I don't have a summary. I have to go through it again. 
Yeah, I, did, I didn't really see a lot there. I mean, from India, it looked like been in the been in the community one year. I, I, I didn't oh, write anything year. else down, so I don't recall. Yeah, one year is what I'd written down. Um, I guess I didn't see anything else that I wrote down that was outstanding. Um, I guess I've lost track. I, I don't. I don't. Who, who is this individual ben, again? Ben Katish, Jenna. Oh. Oh. Yes. Thank you. I think his original application was November of eighteen, so he's probably been been here a little over a year. Well, I, I'd suggest we uh, look more carefully at Lindley, Garski, and well, I guess those two women. Well, I, I mean, I think we're open for a man too. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I mean, it's true. <laughs> it's I kind of like it's, men too. I it's know. none. So I mean, I. So I'm strong. I'm scrolling back up to like the makeup of the um, committee, or of the commission, um, because that could be. Yes. We want to take that in consideration as yeah. well. Yeah, for sure. But we do have some great um, applicants that even the, the three that we just mentioned. That's, that's a, yeah, that's a good point, Bruce, and I'd like to commend all of these applicants. It's, it's great to have mm -hmm. so many applicants, and so many of them do have some, some good qualifications that would fit into this commission really well. So when I was looking at this and looking through all, the, all of the applicants, um, Heterosexual just was all around. Um, and so that also played a little bit of a role in just having a voice of an LGBTQ plus individual at the table. Sure, my recollection though, Bruce, is the last appointee yes. to the commission, to the Human Rights Commission was, um, I think a gay See person, that. gay man. Yes, oh. and, and their name just hasn't appeared on. It is here. This is Zach. Her name should be there, or his name, because I'm not remembering who it was. No, that one says. Yeah, and it, it was Rochester. It, was it comes on here as heterosexual, even though it's non-binary. That list is straight off the application, so however they mark it on the application, so yeah, it so, it in, so. So, as I, so as I read this, it's, I mean, there are heterosexual um, trans individuals, potentially. You know, I don't get. In, I don't know how to explain all of that, but um, I don't see any LGBTQ plus representation off of what we received. Okay. Fair enough. I'll support you. Uh, my notes from the, the last meeting: are is. Rochester is a 23-year-old. And, and I thought that's. I, what I it see was. the word homosexual, yeah. white, non-binary yeah, identity. That's why we Mm -hmm. I really think, you know, I was trying really to appoint, like, to appoint, like, three of the people that immigrants, but by looking just to this, the, the people who are currently there, it yeah. tell me this is really very diverse, and, you know, we, I guess this is really good. That's why I was trying to see somebody else, but I guess we have, all, like, all the diverse that we need. But maybe we can add more too. But yeah, I, I, some people reach out to me, and I was trying really to to say it. But I guess by looking to the the whole thing, I guess find out that we have people from Congo. Have people, I was trying to say like, let us give immigrant more to be on that board because when when they participate, this is really you know make our city stronger because normally they don't participate on this kind of things. But by just looking at it, I find out like at least three yeah. people there mm -hmm. are in this commission, which is make me feel happy. Mm -hmm. I can support Ashley. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Ashley. Fine. Okay. What's yes. what's uh, what's Lindley. the name again? Lindley. Ashley Lindley. Lindley. Okay, so could I have a motion to appoint Lindley, Priest, and Glass? So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Cole, seconded by Mims. I'm getting tired, folks. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 16D.
Public Art Advisory Committee. We have two vacancies to fill a three-year term. I'd suggest Nancy Purrington and Andrea Truitt. Truitt. Uh, Andrea is uh, filling an unexpired term. And Nancy's been on before, I think. Oh, she has this deep she's background. Been, she's applied but, before, but I don't think no, ever. No, she's, she's not okay. been on it. I've been okay. on it. Yeah, I would support Nancy Purrington. I mean, she's reached out to me on multiple occasions, I guess it was a couple years ago, about public gallery, and she has a very well-defined vision in terms of what she'd like to see. I do support Nancy as well. Yeah, I would too. I think you might, were you thinking of maybe Jan? Jan said she'd served 10 years ago uh, on this, but I didn't see that Nancy had. But yeah, she's, but she's she been seems actively well, involved in public art Right, issues. in public art. She's well qualified. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah she uh, was a co-author of the 1997 public arts proposal that resulted in creation of the public mm -hmm. arts advisory committee. It's true, it doesn't expire. So one thing I think about this particular committee is that it, there's no ethnic di diversity or racial diversity on it and you know we can only appoint people who apply but yes of course <laughs> and a lot okay. of people like the human rights commission more than mm -hmm. okay so I, i'm hearing uh, recommendations to appoint purington and pruitt any objection true i just had a little bit of a question on the information it, it, on the matrix, I see that she her term expires in 2022. 22, yeah. So I'm not, I'm and then on the too. cover sheet, it's serving unexpired term ending at the end of this month or at the end of December. How long are their terms? Three year terms. Yeah, I think, John, you're talking about the attendance record lists her term expiring as 22. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when did she come into that term and how much was left of it? I don't know that we're going to be able to answer that question right here and right that now. That comes from staff, so I... Yeah, so we could uh, appoint her and Purrington. But okay. if, if we learn that uh, there's something really awry with the... The dates. The uh, uh, expiration date of her appointment, we could deal with that. Well, so I think I'll proceed that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine. So, uh, could I have a motion to? I already did this, didn't I? I Ask for a motion to appoint Purrington and Truitt. Uh, did I do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. so could I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Mem, second by Teague. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mm -hmm. And lastly, six, item 16E, the Parks and Recreation Commission. We have two vacancies to fill for your terms on it. And let's see, find my notes here. Too far. One male and one, one none. Yeah, one and, and one. And we only have one male applicant, it looks like, which I was comfortable with. I was also. And, and then I thought Melissa Serenda. Surrend, Serenda. She's a naturalist. I thought she looked like a good yeah, fit. Yeah, I thought she'd be a perfect fit. She, yeah, I, I loved what she said about making the natural areas and public spaces where people would feel welcome. That was okay, very so good. Yeah, uh, the, definitely. the recommendation is to appoint Lemiupa and Serenda. Mm -hmm. Could I have a motion to do that, please? So Wait, what, before we. Is, uh, are the asterisks on the application you have to fill, you're required to? It's supposed to make you. I, I think Not on, the demographics. On the uh, Boniface's uh, application, it looks like he didn't fill out the application, or he said non-applicable. I'm not quite sure. Oh, when you say Boniface, you mean Lemiopa? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Which one, John, which? Oh. Under occupation, it just says not up, N-A. <clears throat> oh. yeah, there's it is very little information about him, actually. Maybe he's unemployed. 
Uh -huh. Did he mean that he's unemployed or, right? Does, yeah, that's true. I've seen some with less information. <laughs> I mean, he did fill it in. He put N.A. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Nice. He's been a coach, okay. soccer coach right. and stuff. Yeah. Good enough. Oh, okay. Um, have I asked for a motion to appoint yes. them? And did we do it? Yes. <laughs> Good. Do you have it? No. So moved. I, I moved and no, the move and second. Oh, I don't think we did. We did. So moved. Second, <laughs> Susan and Rocky. Okay. Oh, well, I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> really moved. Okay, could I have a motion to appoint Surrenda yeah, and Lim okay, Yupa? Rockney moved. I seconded. Uh, okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Almost uh, done, guys. Yes. <laughs> Stay <laughs> focused. <laughs> Almost there. Yeah. All right. Uh, item 17, announcement of vacancies previous. Applicants must reside in Iowa City and be 18 years of age unless specific qualifications are stated. We have one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment to the Senior Center Commission. Applications for that position must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, no December the 10th of this year. We have one vacancy to fill an unexpired term upon appointment to the Historic Preservation Commission for an at-large seat. Uh, applications for that position must be received by 5 p.m. Tuesday, November the 26th of this year. We have one vacancy to fill a five-year term on the Airport Zoning Board of Adjustment, one vacancy to fill a three-year term on the Historic Preservation Commission for the East College Street District, one vacancy to fill an unexpired term effective upon appointment to the Woodlawn District of the Historic Preservation Commission, and two vacancies to fill three-year terms on the Senior Center Commission. Vacancies will remain open until filled for those positions. Item 18 would be Austin, if he's still there. He is. <laughs> Hello there, everyone. Uh, Austin Wu, UI City, uh, UI Government, Student Government City Liaison. Uh, it's good to be back. I think it's it's been too long <laughs> since I was uh, back up here. Uh, first thing, uh, I'd I'll, I'll like to offer my personal congratulations to Maddie Bradley for her appointment to the uh, Climate Action Commission. Uh, she's a UI student, a friend of both me and Charlotte, so that was nice to see her name show up. Uh, let's see, one more thing of note is that there, um, of events on campus, is that IC Red, a student organization, is hosting their annual reading of the names for World AIDS Day on Wednesday the 20th in front of the Old Capitol, so tomorrow. Um, usually it takes place on uh, the 1st of December, which is World AIDS Day, but since that is during Thanksgiving break, this year is happening quite a bit earlier, hence the date tomorrow. Um, I encourage everyone here to sign up for a five minute slot to read names. If you have time and the desire, uh, the link to this and other events can be found on their Facebook page if you just look up Icy Red. Um, and if, uh, for people who aren't necessarily aware, the reading the names is um, reading the names of people who have passed away from HIV and AIDS from dawn to dusk. And it's an annual event. It's really nice. Uh, I make an effort to participate every year. So I'd encourage everyone here to do the same as well. Thanks. Thank you, Austin. Okay, so that gets us to item number 19, City Council information. Can we start with Maza here and move to the right? Oh, I uh, wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> uh, I don't remember I have something. I, get, I was in Washington, D.C. on uh, just for like I attended a uh, new leader, new leaders, uh, new American leader, uh, where um, th this organization based on New York, they just invited all the people who've been elected, the people of color, the first, uh, first uh, you know, generation American who been elected to officer, office. I think I saw a lot of people who like just look like me and been elected to different kind of person from city council, school board to even, uh, you know, the um, uh, state or Congress, which is uh, like make me feel like really good. And uh, I met uh, five of them just being elected on November. Uh, one of them in from Minnesota and Maine and uh, Missouri, I, a lot, a lot of people. I really, yes, love it, and I spend very good time going to the Congress and see like uh, the people talking about bills and 
going to the house also, and uh, it, it, we get like really great time over there. Yeah, that's the only thing that they have. Great, that brings us to Rocky. Yeah, I don't really have a lot to add other than that. I'm very much looking forward to our work session on the mobile home task force. So yes. stay tuned, public. I think it's gonna be a very productive, engaging discussion um, on this important issue. I'll just throw out, which I, has been pretty well publicized, but this coming Thursday at 5.30 at Big Grove will be our Iowa City Climate Expo. So it um, should be a fun event, as well as informative. <laughs> Always a good combination. Um, not much. Just had a chance to get out of town on a little vacation and see family. So enjoy winter here in Iowa City and winter in Vermont for a few days. So enjoy it. Good to be back. Very good. <laughs> Uh, as far as committee assignments, um, well, many of us were at uh, last Wednesday, the MPO meeting. It was a very uh, interesting meeting, I thought. Uh, uh, one item was that it will be Iowa City's turn to designate a rep to the East Central Iowa County of Governments uh, coming next year. So uh, we'll need to think about uh, who might be interested in, in being on that commission. Uh, we talk a lot about road safety, and they, they talked about the safety targets that are set by the Federal Highway Administration and, and whether we want to go along with that, set them lower, set them higher. So that was an interesting discussion. Um, did an update on the area bike master plan and trail. Sounds like it's moving along. We might even be a bike all the way up to Minnesota someday there, Rockney. Uh, it's moving right along. And also the passenger rail study, it still is out there. You don't hear much about it, but it's in phase three. And uh, there's still folks out there that want to see that. Uh, so uh, look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and then uh, they included a really uh, colorful graphic of uh, current projects and the road projects, two huge graphics. I can share those with you, or you can find them online, of uh, the road projects, bridge projects over the next two to three to five years. Very interesting to see that. Um, let's see. Oh, and today, <laughs> Mazahir, here. Mazahir here and I met. Yes. I've been <laughs> sitting and waiting for a rules committee meeting, which hasn't happened in, in years, <laughs> but uh, we did get to, to have that today. Uh, uh, looked at the bylaws for the CPRB and the Climate Action Committee. The, of course, the Climate Action Commission was brand new set that was pretty much designed on, on standard ones, and the CPRB was to include that we would have uh, a council rep that, uh, and the name would be given to, to new members members of that committee. So that was very interesting. Um, coming up this week, uh, Thursday, the employee lunch. Uh, that's that's always a fun event too and different this year. We won't need to be serving. We can just uh, sit around and chat with the employees, which there's a great bunch of employees out there. Uh, some of the just fun things. Um, Thursday uh, did attend the tra Transit Study Committee meeting that was in Coralville. They apparently had three of those back to back uh, at the University of Coralville and then in, I in, in Iowa City. I went to the Coralville one. There was a it was very well attended. Um, apparently, all three were were well attended. Uh, very impressive data. Uh, showed that the, the three systems in the area, the Coralville, the Canvas, and Iowa City had 51 routes, 6 million bus trips per year, and 42 passengers per revenue hour of service uh, each day. Uh, the consultants were there, uh, so it was great to meet them, see who were paying to do all this great stuff, and uh, so it was fun to see that. They also had some very lovely graphics to look at. Uh, and then on Sunday, I attended the uh, Family Folk Machine concert at the Inglert. Uh, it's a really fun thing. Uh, everybody should try to, to attend one of those events at some point. It, although it's, uh, it's, it is done in partnership with the Senior Center, but uh, it's a multi-generational uh, group of, of singers and, and musicians, and it's really great to see the, the younger children that are participating. And if, if you weren't Toe tapping along with the music, there was something wrong with your toes because it, it it's really fun and and their uh, rendition of uh, Bob Dylan's uh, times that are changing just gave me goosebumps and and I'm seeing Laura out there and I'm so happy to have her on on the council now because uh, uh, I saw her name in in the program and along with Bruce here we're going to have another very musically talented she sang as well as played the cello and so that that was great it was fun to see her see a familiar face up there so do try to attend uh, uh, the Family Folk Machine concerts if you ever see them advertised. I thought you were going to say that Laura is a Bob Dylan fan. Yeah, well, hey, hey, I think hey, she hey, was. Hey. She was up there tapping to the music and singing along. So um, that's it. Well, uh, Jeff uh, Fruin, our city manager, on the 5th 
uh, Tuesday the 5th, he gave the sizzle speech over at um, Big Grove. And so again, I know in our packets, well, his Friday memo to us, he uh, gave some of the data that he gave, uh, some of the PowerPoint. I would encourage all of you to really review that because it was really good uh, information about what's happening in Iowa City. And so um, he gave sizzle. And thank you, Jeff, for doing that. I was happy to be a part. And the mayor was there also. Um, the mo I attended uh, a meeting downtown at uh, Midwest One Bank, and it was on the mobility forum. Uh, Darian, uh, Mark, and Kent from the city, they did this wonderful um, just presentation. And it, it was interesting because when, when we think about mobility, we always think about what is here now. But their vision and what they work on, it was very insightful. They look at what's here now, uh, what the future looks at. Um, the, the modes that might be possible. And so that was really good to hear them uh, uh, have this open forum with downtown district. Um, and there was a lot of input from the downtown district uh, individuals. And so it was really good to be a part of that. Um, uh, Maz and I actually attended, um, it was the Johnson County Livable Community Transportation Action Team along with the SEATS Paratransit. Um, and this was um, at the Human Services uh, Building. And of course, the Transportation Study Consultants were also there. So it was, it was kind of a combination of um, presentation with um, just like a listening um, by what the community wanted. And so that was very insightful, very, um, I thought it gave a good picture of what we're looking at with the di three different um, busing transportation systems already in place. So that was uh, very, I, I really enjoyed that information. Uh, of course, went to the N NPOJC. Um, many of us were there at that. Other than that, there was an a, a awesome and amazing celebration earlier today, which I'm going to refer to the mayor to talk about. <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> yeah, so I, I sizzled, too, <laughs> along with uh, in watching Jeff's presentation. It was fun to do. I attended a transit study open house, but the one here at the library, it was instructive. I had a chance to attend Civic's annual meeting on the 7th of November, and that reminded me that the Mandela Fellows were brought here. To, uh, I had a chance to meet the Mandela Fellows when they were brought over here by Civic volunteers. And that's, I think, the third year, maybe the fourth, that the Mandela Fellows have been coming here. It's really, really been a treat to meet them. Uh, I was interviewed on KICI radio about our climate action efforts on the 15th. Holly Hart did the interviewing. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to hear an awesome and amazing hmm. colleague of ours uh, make a terrific and enthusiastic speech after following um, my more a much more tame presentation. Mm. You were awesome <laughs> and amazing as well. <laughs> yeah. And tomorrow I'm going to help read names on World AIDS Day. I've done that many, many times now over the years, and I'll do it, at, I think, at 12.05. Let's see. Last, I want to congratulate Laura Burgess for her election, Janice Weiner, who may be watching on television, for being elected two weeks ago, and John and Pauline for being reelected. Bravo to you. Well done. Okay, city staff, that'd be Jeff first. You've had enough sizzle for one night, I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing for me. Looks to me like we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Mim, second by Cole. All, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion uh, opposed. Aye. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Right.